across uh, across New Brunswick. Um, I'd like to introduce. Uh, we are on Wabanaki unceded territory, and I'd like to introduce Alma Brooks to come up and say a few words. I'd like to welcome everybody here to our territory. I've come to share a little bit, uh, probably like an update. Um, and I want to first of all talk about who we are. We are Wolostogawi, and recently we've been called Maliseets. The Mi'kmaq called us Maliseet, and, uh, and then the non-native people call us Maliseet, and now we call ourselves Maliseet. But, um, you are on Mousy territory. We have just recently concluded uh, the Mousy Grand Council Fire over the past weekend. It was hosted by Madawaska Winog. We are also Eastern Wabanaki, and we are a member nation of the Confederacy, the Wabanaki Confederacy. Uh, the Mousy Grand Council is based on the clan system. It is, it is our traditional structure, our traditional decision-making structure. And the clan system is basically extended families. Grand Council is the people. And we are the title holders of this territory, lands and waters within our traditional territory. And this territory uh, is a gift to us from the Creator. And we have never ill-treated that gift, nor ceded or surrendered any portion of it. The Grand Council now has a, a constitution and a charter of rights. We also have um, a citizenship code, and uh, no longer will the federal government tell us who we are. We will decide who our people are. We will also decide who has rights. And as title holders, we also hold jurisdiction on our land. We understand that lately uh, New Brunswick has given licenses to uh, third parties to use our land. And they have done this without our permission. Uh, not only land, but our, take our resources as well. So if, uh, if they have said or if they have told people that they have been consulted, we want to know with who, because uh, our people have not given permission. And as well, we have been told at our Grand Council meeting that the INAC chiefs uh, don't know uh, what's going on either, nor the councils. So, uh, one band alone or unauthorized individuals cannot give permission on collective rights. And the title and use of our land is a collective right. Um, also, the Mi'kmaq, they have their own territory and they do not make decisions in uh, Maliseet Nation territory. And one name that I know of that's been thrown around a bit is Roger Augustine. And I just want to say that Roger Augustine does not speak for Maliseet people. And he does not make decisions in Maliseet territory. And uh, I even have my doubts whether or not he speaks even for the Mi'kmaq. The Maliseet Grand, Grand Council, um, we are united. The people off and on reserves are uniting, and this is also going to include the INAC chiefs as well, who have said and, uh, that they agree with unity. And we are speaking as a, a people, uh, the people of the beautiful river, Bolostogawik. We will unite together, we will speak as a one voice. 
The Grand Council wants full disclosure of everything that is happening on our land, on our waterways, and for our information. We will designate how our land will be used. And we will entertain proposals from the public um, as well regarding land use. So with that, um, we, we've done a lot of work. Uh, our people, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good day for us. Uh, the Supreme Court decision that came down um, has helped to um, strengthen our voices. And so I don't know, um, you know, we're just gonna walk forward and I'm anxious to hear what the other speakers have to say tonight. And uh, um, I was asked to come and, and speak on behalf of the Grand Council here. So, thank you very much. Thank you. So now I would like to introduce to you Mr. Charles Terry. Epsilas, Mr. Mcmowick to Scotch. Welcome. I speak Mcmac just a little bit, but the reason I do is that I spent two years with a great historian in the Papineau band, Gilbert Sewell, and that time changed my life. And I got to see things in a different light. And I see things now as things need to be fixed. Things need to be arranged properly, with honor, dignity, but we have to make things right. That's why I was happy to see Alma here today, because it's an issue that we have to deal with. It has to come forward and it has to be fixed. Now, the reason I'm up here, I can easily say, is because Gilbert Sewell changed my life. And he taught me not to be afraid to speak up. And that's what I've been doing. Now, I'll tell you my little history. I've been a filmmaker now for 37 years in New Brunswick, and I've always been giving my voice to others. Now I've decided to stand in front of the camera for the first time in my life and give voice to the people around me. I moved to Keswick seven years ago, and I, like every other New Brunswicker, thought that the forest industry was well, that it nourished our province. I had always understood it was our largest economic engine and that everything was hunky-dory. When I moved to Keswick, it didn't take me very long to find out that things were wrong. Now, Keswick really is in the center of northern New Brunswick. You've got Edmonston in one corner, Hamilton in the other, and right dead center in the middle of all that forest is Keswick. So people live, 90% of the economy is, is really is created from the forest. But one day I find this young man who had attempted to commit suicide. He was 27. And I said, why? He says, well, you know, I couldn't take it anymore. I'm in debt up to my ears. My wife was leaving me because I wasn't, you know, talking to her anymore. I wasn't seeing the kids anymore. I said, what kind of debt are we talking about? He says, well, $450,000. What? Yeah. He says, if I wanted to work, I had to buy this machine and I had to, to get it co-signed by the Irving Company so that I could actually work. And work he did. You know, 18 hours a day, and then his machine had to work 24 hours a day, and he had to hire crews to work it around. Anyway, it just became really, really overwhelming for him. So started asking around and Everybody else was in the same boat, you know, choked to that, economically captured. And, okay, so what's going on? Then I get a phone call from a friend of mine, Chamber of Commerce, and he said, Charles, I, I have something to tell you. I says, okay. So we go and have a couple of beers. He says, three months ago, I went with the mayor and the union of our mill, because we're a mill town, and they run seven months a year, one shift, 
and was having a hard time keeping them on. We went to Fredericton and uh, the Irving Company asked us to ask for more wood. We needed another 44,000 cubic meters of wood, so then we would run 10 months a year. So we go to Fredericton and the mayor says, okay, we need another 44,000 cubic meters of wood. Our community is struggling and we should have that wood because we're surrounded by the largest uh, license in New Brunswick, the number one license, so that it makes no sense. We should be able to keep our boys working. The deputy minister has got this page sliding back and forth. He says, oh, I don't understand. You guys should have more than enough wood to operate year round. The mayor says, no, we have so much wood from one license and so much wood from another, we need another 44,000 cubic meters. <clears throat> Deputy Minister flicks the page, and three years prior, they had allocated to the Irving Company, or to the mill in Ketchwick, an extra 83,000 cubic meters of wood. So he says, I don't get it. You guys should be working full-time two shifts. The mayor looks at that and goes, no. No, that's never been cut here. And the union guys say, that's never been cut here. Yet the Irving Company was reporting that it was. There was an Irving Company rep there. And he goes, oh, oh. They had forgotten that they had been, I call it stealing the wood from our mill, sending it somewhere else, keeping our mill choked. Why? I don't know. But when this guy told me that, I said, Makes sense. And then so I call uh, one of our counselors and I said, Do you know anything about this? He says, No. The mayor hasn't told us anything. This is true. And then I call the president of the Chamber of Commerce. She says, I know nothing about this. So see, the mayor, the Chamber of Commerce, and even the union had known about it for three months, had not mentioned it to the counselors, nor to the members, nor to the union members. But we had been, wood had been getting, leaving, not coming to our community, although they had been declaring it was being cut and cut. That represented a million dollars in hard earned salary every year for three years. So that's a minimum of six million dollars of economic activity that we did not get in our community. So I got kind of mad. I wrote Mr. Irving a letter, an email, sent it off to him. An hour later, I get a phone call from the president of the union screaming in my ear saying, Charles, you stay out of this. This is none of your affairs. This is union affair. And I said, oh, hold on now. Is this Crown Forest? Yes. Well, apparently we are all owners of the Crown Forest here. So I do have an interest. And if that wood that's been stolen is affecting my community, my neighbors, our commerce, then I should find out something about it. I have a right to say something. Now, I write a letter to all of the newspapers, everyone, stating this is what I found out, this is the proof, here it is. Nothing. I call CBC, nothing. I call Radio Canada, nothing. The only one that got back to me was La Petite Nouvelle, the French newspaper. You know, Irving doesn't own it yet. Although right now, as of the last six months, they publish it, they distribute it, and they actually work out of Irving-owned offices. But they don't own it yet. The only other one, I think, in New Brunswick is the St. Croix Courier. But everything else. But nobody, other than La Petite Nouvelle. So at least, the journalist calls the deputy minister, calls the minister, minister confirms, yes, this is a true document, and it's up to the urban company to make sure that that wood works its way back to Kedgewick. And that in the following years, now he has to include that extra 83,000 cubic meters. So right now, in Kedgewick, the mill is working 12 months a year, two full shifts, and everybody's happy. But you know what? The workers still hate me. Why do they hate me? It's because I remind them that they're scared. When, when uh, uh, I, that all came out, and then the reaction right away was, Charles, shut up because Irving's going to close the mill. He's going to hurt us just to get back at you. He's going to hurt us. 
And I was intimidated, my dog was poisoned, and they blocked the, the, the entrance to our, to our, uh, our driveway, trucks. I had to get out there and tell the guys, come on, guys, you know. And at night, you know these thousands of million dollar watts of light? They'd drive by two or three in the morning and flash it in our windows. That's intimidating. Even though they started working in the middle, the wood was coming in, they just, and then to me, my logic was, okay, you know in the, 18, the 1800s, when you had the black slaves in the South U.S., there were a thousand slaves in a cotton field and it only took 10 white people to control the thousand slaves. And if one of the slaves stood up and said, this is not right, the others would sit down, sit down, you'll get notice. You know, they're mad at us and, and they'll harm us. Well, you know that instituted fear still exists in our communities. So I, as a filmmaker, I'm really curious. I'm like, okay, hold on, what's going on here? I wasn't expecting this. So then I start finding out things and I start digging. I find out that the Minister of Natural Resources, just from an article I'm reading, is saying that the urban paper reported, that basically uh, the minister says that the private woodland owners are not selling their pulp wood and they're, they're basically, you know, starving out here and it's competition with the, with the crown wood pulp, pulp. So he's ordered all the private companies, all the licensees to leave the pulp in the woods so that the private woodland owners can sell their pulp, at least make some money. And next day I find out the urban company says, no, Jim Irving says, I'm sorry, we have a special arrangement with the government. I don't have to listen to the minister. My machines are going to stay in the wood and we're going to keep pulling the pulp up. Now, what's going on here? You know, here you've got a, a business owner who says he doesn't have to listen to the minister. So who's running the show? Then I find out, I call the private woodlot owners and I find out their situation, what's been happening. And I start putting dots together and saying, okay, we're in a mess here. It looks like corruption in a big way. So I decided I was going to do a docudrama. So what I'm going to do, a document. So what I'm going to do is basically do interviews and do just like Charles LeBlanc does. As soon as he does an interview, puts it up on the web. And you know what? People started following me. And as I kept moving forward, <coughs> interviewing people, I'd start getting phone calls. Charles, I'd like to participate. I like what you're doing. It's about time this information comes out because we're starting to get a picture now of the mess that we're in. You know, our forest used to be the largest economic engine. It really did. I was brought up in school and told that our forest paid for our health care, our schools, and the repair of our infrastructure and the maintenance of it. If you look at it today, that's not the case. So this is one of the videos that I've done that you can find on my website, which is isourforestreallyhours.com. I've got 24 of them. But this is the one that really sort of shocked everyone, and they sort of got a sense about how big a mess we're in and how corruption is sort of rampant inside this small little group. So we'll play. It's about Bud and Frank. There we go. You know when you learn something about somebody and it, 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 it bothers you so much that there's a pain in the pit of your stomach? Well, <laughs> that's happened to me recently. A couple of weeks ago, somebody sent me some information regarding the, the web of influence, you know, between politicians, entrepreneurs, regarding the crown force. So I'll begin my story. This is Bud Bird. Now, way back in 1982, Bud Bird was the Minister of Natural Resources for the Hatfield government. He's the one that came up with the concept, the idea of creating forest licenses. So take the whole crown forest, split it in 10, hand it over to industry, so they'll manage it, right? For the benefit of New Brunswick. 
Now, not long after he passes law, by the British government, 1982, and becomes a director of one of those big companies, Fraser Papers, which had mills, a couple of mills around New Brunswick and logging operations, especially a big mill in, in Edmonton. Huge industrial forest, freehold as well. So, election comes along in 1987, Hatfield gets booted out, and Frank McKenna gets elected in. Now, from 1982 to 1992, the Crown Forest Act more or less hobbled along. You know, the act that was created in 1982 stipulated, okay, the industry manages the Crown Forest. However, before having access to the Crown Forest, they must first purchase the AAC annual allowable cut from the private woodlot owners. And the private woodlot owners were going through marketing boards. So the marketing boards were negotiating a price with the industry. So the industry was forced to purchase from the marketing boards before having access to the ground forest. Now the price that was paid for the private woodlot owners wood was directly related to how much the industry was paying the province for the crown forest. See, so it made it fair. Come 1992, Frank McKenna modifies that law. He changes it. Whereas the government of the industry no longer really has to purchase the AAC from the private woodland owners. So right away, the first thing that happened is that the marketing boards representing the private woodland owners, they lost all bargaining power. Basically, industry could set its price. You know, well, you know, we're only going to pay you so much. Of course, when they dropped the price, uh, they paid the marketing boards for the wood. They also dropped the price that they paid the province for the ground forest. You know, it was all set together. So if the industry could force down the price, they'd pay less for private wood and they'd pay less for ground wood. And that's been the situation since 1992. <laughs> you know, it, it's now to the point where, you know, private woodlots, it's 34% of all the forests in New Brunswick, but a lot of them don't even bother cutting their out west of, uh, you know, working or northern Quebec working. It's not worth the gas to cut the wood on their lawn to sell to the industry. The price is so low. Some of the wood that's being bought or sold are the 1980 prices, and we're 32 years later. Okay, so let's move up to 19, no, let's move up to 2008. Industry's having a hard time. Fraser Papers is really, really on shaky legs. Forget Bud Bird is still a director. Now, 2008, Frank McKenna is no longer in government. However, he is director of the company that owns Fraser Papers, Brookfield Asset Management. So again, he's on the scene. He's a director. Fraser Papers is on shaky ground. The mill in Edmonton is about to go down. Okay. So these guys figure out, well, what we need to do to save the company is what's what's the richest thing we have? The richest thing we have is our forest. That's that's a moneymaker, forest. Okay, great. Let's take the company, Fraser's, and split it into create two new companies. We're going to create Acadian Timber. Okay. And that, that'll be the, the forest. That's going to be the uh, industrial freehold. And then the, what's left, the mill, and that's the one that's not making money. We're going to call that Twin Rivers. Okay. So they split the company. Now they split the company, and right away, the mill is really shaky. So they have to find a way to refinance. They have to find a way to go, mm, okay, what do we do? Well, we have a huge debt. We owe the province of New Brunswick $38 million. Oh, okay, well listen, we're gonna make a few phone calls, convince the government, this guy, convince, well, I think it's Sean Graham, maybe, maybe, but not there. Convince him to say, well listen, that debt, $38 million, um, why don't we offer $38 million worth of shares to the province? <laughs> so it won't be debt anymore, it'll be preferred stock. 
Okay, so please, government, you know, invest, uh, let's convert the debt into stock, into this almost bankrupt country. So they managed to do that. Now, next thing they do is they go to the workers, the right retirees, and say, okay, guys, sorry, we've been playing in your pension fund. We don't have any more money, you know. So we figure if you have, I think it's 25 years or less in the company, you won't have a pension. And if it's a bit more, if it's at 25 years or more, well, your pension is reduced by 35%. Now we're talking 400, 450 people who pension plan, who they work for 30, 40 years at this mill, and, and, and put in money, and, and, and the company puts in money, and then when the company gets so shaky and gets refinanced into uh, and reorganized into Twin Rivers, Twin Rivers says, sorry guys, pension plan is gone. Or it's reduced quite a bit. And the pensioners go, okay, well, we're going to take you to court. We're going to going to sue you for, for the money that you owe us. Well, go ahead and sue us. You know, we don't have any money. Of course you do. You have the force. No, 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 the force. That's another company. That's all together. has nothing to do with this new company called Twin Rivers. Okay. So you see, these guys are smart. And the most important thing to do, they have to do is, is to make money, of course. Hold on, I drop my, my photo. Oh. So today, 2012, these guys are still on the scene. There's a Canadian timber, and Bud Bird's a, a, a director. And then Brookfield Asset Management, that owns a Canadian timber and Twin Rivers, of which Frank McKenna is the chairman of the board. Right? Now these guys created the Crown Forest Act and modified the Crown Forest Act into what it is today. And we both know that today, it's not bringing in any money to the province. None. They've been able to work it so that these, their company, of which they are part of, is making a tremendous amount of money for the Crown Forest. But we, the owners of that Crown Forest, are not making any money at all. I mean, the, the uh, Auditor General of New Brunswick says there's no way of, for us of knowing if we're getting our money's worth from these industries because they own, they control such a large part of it. You know? So here we go, two politicians that we trusted to give us good direction in the province. They create these laws that years later, in fact, they exploit to make money from. Isn't that something? And while they were doing that, they've managed to ruin the lives of 450 pensioners. You know, guys who have dedicated years and years of their effort, blood, sweat, and tears so these guys can make money. And when it comes up at the, at the, at the hard time, they take whatever riches they have and they put that away and they secure it. Cajun timber, oh, that's rich. But that, no, you guys can't have access to it. And here we are in Brunswick with these guys and we're letting them do that to us. It's incredible. We really, really have to, to get together you know, and force the government to take industry out of managing our crown for us. Maybe one day, soon I hope, we'll be able to see a benefit, a true benefit. I mean, when you've got worldwide forestry economics experts telling us we're losing $150 million a year, maybe. You know, so how many years has it been? Come on, guys. This is ridiculous. This is so blatant, I felt a pain in the pit of my stomach. So somehow, we have to wake the people of New Brunswick and say, we can't let this happen anymore. If we can't afford health care, we can't afford our schools, and we can't afford to fix our roads, Basically, it's because these guys created a law that's bleeding us dry. Please, go to my website, www is our forest really ours. Take a look at the website, sign the petition, 
Together, we can make a change. Thank you. You know when you learn something about somebody and it, 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 it bothers you? It's a good looking fella. <laughs> So this was the first example of how government, the heart town, to ruin the lives of 450 pensioners who have given their blood, sweat, and tears away to make sure that, of course, they had work and the company made profit. So there was a deal sign, you know? They never kept up their part of the bargain. That bothered. So I kept digging more and digging more and finding more information. And the interesting thing is, as I said, as I kept moving forward, people kept calling me. I said, Charles, I've got this story, you know. They've clear cut around the whole scout camp. We've had a scout camp on Crown, on Crown Fort for 50 years. We went back this weekend, guess what? They clear cut 200 acres all around it, left the building standing, but everything else is gone. Can you help? Well, I said, all I can do is tell the story. But you know what? They didn't call. They didn't get a warning. And when finally they were able to sit in front of the minister and the, the boss of uh, Acadian Timber, the reaction was, well, Mr. Scoutmaster, I think you should look at it this way. S see how your scouts now will be able to observe how a forest grows. <laughs> you know, the insolence of it. But that's the attitude they have. We're not going to get unfazed here, you know. These are just little boys there. There's nothing to do with this serious business of forestry. Anyway, getting in the way of making our money. The more I keep digging, the more I find out that this deal that was signed 32 years ago has been rotten for the province. It's been rotten for the private woodland owners and industry's been managing it the way they want to. We've brought in experts who have analyzed it and studied it. They all come up with these reports that says, Jesus, we should be looking at separating industry from managing that forest. And every time it just gets buried. So if you go on the website and look at the other stories, you'll find some interesting things. We've had ministers and former deputy ministers and university professors and experts and private woodlot owners all telling us the same thing. Yet government is not listening. Now one thing government is not listening that's so blatant, it's poisoning us. Communities are rising. People are signing petitions by the thousands. Yet still, we're not listening. That has to tell you something about the type of control that the force industry has over our government. Now, one of the persons that called and said, I'd like to participate, Charles, is Mr. Rod Cumberland. I'd like to invite Rod to come up. He's a biologist, was a dear biologist for the province, I think, for 15, 20 years. Recently, he changed jobs. And that allowed him to say what he knows. And I think you will find all of this very interesting. Monsieur and Madame Rod Cumberland. Thank you, Charles, very much, and uh, thank you all for coming. Um, it was never my plan to get involved in something like this. It's just sort of, as you hear my presentation, you'll understand why I'm here doing what I'm doing. But I called it the deer in the kettle, and I've given this presentation at uh, several different venues. I gave it at the Atlantic Society of Fish and Wildlife Biologists uh, just this spring, and it was uh, very well received. And Nova Scotia came out and said, we have the same thing happening here in Nova Scotia. But uh, the I call it the deer in the kettle because there's, a, there's an analogy that, that's used uh, with uh, a frog. And if you take a frog and put a frog in a pot of boiling water on the stove, he'll know it's bad and jump out. But if you take that same frog and you put him in a lukewarm uh, kettle of water and slowly turn the heat up? He'll still jump out. Will he, really? Yeah, it was a, a lobotomized frog. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the way it goes, he'll stay in that kettle. We'll have to try this, won't we? <laughs> Anyhow, he, stay, he stays in the kettle and he keeps swimming around because he doesn't realize that the change is so slow, he'll stay there and boil to death. So, uh, 
Anyhow, I think the same things happen with deer, and I want to and I want to explain to you what what I've lived through in the last uh, 15 years, and see how gradually and slowly this change has come about until finally we realize, uh oh, something's wrong. Someone fell asleep at the wheel. Next slide, please. So a little bit of background. Um, when I first started speaking out on this, I was told that I was uh, I was anti-forestry and. Uh, which isn't the case at all. Um, I was raised by a, a diesel mechanic. He worked for George Pacific. I was raised on blue collar pulp mill dollars in Charlotte County. So, uh, and I am a lumberjack <coughs> and I'm okay <laughs> with that. Um, anyhow, I, I, the, the woods is part of who I am and what I do. So, I mean, I, and, and I'm not out to, to put anybody out of business, but rather than making $15 billion, maybe you can make $5 billion and we can all be happy which is really gets at the, at the base of what this is all about. It's not about losing money, okay? Let's, you need to be clear about that. Every time they say this is about losing money. No, it, it's about you not being as rich as you are. That, that's really what, what this boils down to. Um, I graduated from UNB Forestry and I took a wildlife uh, minor while I was there. And while I was there at UNB, we, had, we were looking at the Woodstock model and, and predicting the growth of the forest over, the, over time. And we knew in 25 years, this was back in the 80s, we knew in 25 years there was going to be a wood crunch. And we were told about it in all of our classes and how the wood supply was going to drop down. And in 25 years, we were going to get really low on wood, even though we're harvesting sustainably. Now, I don't understand how we can harvest sustainably in one run of wood, but that's what we've done. So uh, we knew that. We knew we were going to run out of wood. Okay? That was a given. And, and we were taught it, and all the foresters after me were all taught the same thing. We're going to run out of wood. Next slide, please. So, uh, in government, government's responsible for, for wildlife, and of course, we, government also has control over crown land. And half the province is crown land, so if you're going to manage some, a crown resource like wildlife, the best place to grow it is on crown land, because the people own the land, the people own the animals, so why not grow it there? And years ago, when my dad first started hunting, that's where they used to go. They always went to crown land to hunt deer, because there was a ton of deer on crown land. And I had to actually convince some of my buddies that this here a while ago, and I couldn't understand, they didn't realize there was deer on crown land years and years ago, there was a ton of deer on crown land. Dave Coburn, uh, that I live with out in Kensington Creek, he never had apple problems 20 years ago. There was never problems in St. John 20 years ago with deer, because the deer were in the woods. Now all of a sudden the deer, people think there's lots of deer around because they're in their backyard. People, there's no deer in the woods, I'm telling you, I'm going to explain why. So, <clears throat> anyways, government had responsibility to, uh, to manage it. So as wildlife biologists are employed by the Fish and Wildlife Branch, and I started in 1990, but in the mid-80s, before I got there, we had a habitat program and they said, well, we know this wood shortage is coming. The forest is going to change. So being a responsible biologist for the wildlife out there, what needs this forest type? Next slide, please. So we said, uh, things are going to get scarce. Wildlife needs habitat. It's taught all the time in all of our hunter education courses that wildlife needs habitat. What's habitat? It's the forest. It's the forest that's out there. So every time they cut a tree, they're changing habitat. So we looked at every species and said, okay, well, what does each of these species require? And we came up with ones that needed this forest, this old growth forest that was going to uh, be depleted. Pine marten, pileated woodpecker, there's all kinds of animals, uh, so small songbirds, white-tailed deer wintering areas, there's all kinds of things that need it. So if you're going to remove it, it's going to impact those. And of course, there's been none of that talked about in the media whatsoever, nothing. We're going to drop the, the oh, we're going to create 500 jobs. Really? Well, we should talk about how many wildlife are going to lose their habitat over this, but it's, it's, it's all silent. It's all secret. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so anyways, what we did back in the, in the late 80s, uh, the, a few things we did as the big game people started flying the province, and we started mapping, mapping out deer yards. And most people probably know that in the wintertime, in this neck of the woods, deer will uh, migrate towards a wintering area because our winters are tough, their legs are only so long, they need... Some places get out of the weather and that they can pack the snow down in these deer yards and get around a lot better on these trails. So uh, we flew the landscape, all of our regional biologists did it, and every time they saw this congregation of deer in the wintertime, they'd draw a little line around it and say, okay, well, there's, we know that's a deer yard there, we know it's a deer yard here, and they mapped them all across the province, and we set them aside. We said, these are deer yards, they're actively used by deer, they're uh, habitual, they go there year in, year out, so we need to save these things down the road. When that big crunch comes, we need to save it because the deer are going to need it. And then we did the same thing for pine marten and for pileated woodpecker and for all the animals that needed this type of habitat. And then the fish people did the same thing for all their fish stuff. They said, well, gee, the things that forestry impacts on our fish is, you know, all of a sudden you've got all kinds of runoff, you get a lot of mud in the streams, it silts up their, their uh, spawning beds, and then, of course, it raises the water temperature, so we need to buffer these uh, areas. We need, to, we need to make sure that they don't harvest too close to streams. So back in the late 80s, early 90s, we described all this. 
Okay, and you can find all kinds of documents at DNR that say what we did over this time. And it was all set aside and said, okay, well, this, this, this is all the habitat we need to sustain the wildlife needs. The other stuff that needs uh, other, other types of forests are going to be all right. So, as of the early 90s, we had it all set aside. We said, okay, well, here's what we need. There was a few modifications to it over time, but basically, it ended up being about 35% of the Crown land. That is the conservation forest. So when they talk about conservation forest in the papers, when they talk about this uh, giving up more wood, 70% has been cut. This is all that's left, and they want it. Okay, they want it because they've cut everything else. And uh, Charles was just talking about that. You can go online, there's all kinds of things. You can take a look at this from the air. It's pretty amazing to see from the air. Anyhow, we had it all set aside, but even though we had 35% set aside, a lot of the deer yards are vacant. What went wrong? Who was asleep at the wheel there? Why are deer yards vacant? They're saying, oh, we're going to cut 300 deer yards under this new plan, and we're not going to affect the deer, because there's no deer there. Why on earth are there no deer there? They're all in Quiz Pam, Sis, and Frederick, and everywhere else. Why is that? You need to ask some questions. Next slide, please. So what's happened? Well, there's been a few changes over time. Back when I first started, we were cutting with chainsaws and skitters. Lots of people were employed. They talk about creating jobs. Well, they should because they put all kinds of people out of work in the last 20 years modernizing. Okay, I know all kinds of guys that have skitters sitting in their backyard that don't move anymore because they went to processors. More efficient. Cut a lot of wood a lot faster. Um, the other thing they did, they changed how the force is regenerated. And this is, my, this is my big beef, is they've changed how the force is regenerated. And for years we kept saying, well, there's all kinds of cutting going on, so we're creating all kinds of young growth, which is what deer need. Deer need the little stuff and uh, the young stuff for food. And, of course, they need the older stuff for, for deer yards. So when we went from natural regeneration to plantations, we changed things. <clears throat> and, then of course, we also changed the intensity and the speed and the size of the cut. So a lot of things have changed over the 20 years that I was a deer biologist. And, again, it was a slow, methodical change. Whether that frog jumps out or not, the deer did it. Okay, so <laughs> it kept happening over time. Next slide, please. So here's a, here's a slide that shows these are actual numbers, and there's all kinds of these numbers out there. All you have to do is ask for them. They're right there at, uh, at DNR. And this shows uh, the number of plantations over time. This is 1962 to 2004. So the dark blue line is number of plantations, or the, the hectares that are planted, and the pink line is the, uh, how much we've herbicided. The other thing they found out, uh, when Charles talked about the annual allowable cut, they're allowed to cut so much wood every year because they're expecting so much wood to come online down the road. And they realized years ago that if they plant little green trees in the ground, and we all, as a kid, we went out and we planted little green trees, what a great thing. And, and we all were taught that. It's great to plant a tree, you're replacing what you took, it's, all, it's very responsible, la la la. Sounds good, but really what we started doing was making plantations. And they realized when they made these plantations, what, the, what happens in the Acadia forest when you cut it? As the hardwoods grow really quick, they're early successional species, they're uh, shade intolerant, they have to grow fast and occupy the site. And the little green trees, they're there at the same time, they're just little seedlings, but they're shade tolerant, they're, so it takes them a long time to grow. And you see that if you look around the province, you'll see all these big birch and uh, poplar trees there, and you'll see the evergreens come up, they're about halfway up them. And then over time, they all die out at 80 years, and the green trees take over and away they go. But it takes a long time for those little green trees to occupy the site. So the forestry companies realized, rather than fighting with these hardwood trees, let's get rid of them. So they found a herbicide, they tested all kinds of herbicides, but they found one called glyphosate. Remember that word, glyphosate, and it was phenomenal because it killed things dead. I mean, it worked phenomenal. And if it didn't, it just sprayed a second time, and it would get it the second time around. <laughs> and again, don't, don't let them fool you. I mean, that, that's what they do. And our plantations, what the whole idea is to get them 95 to 100% evergreen trees. And from a forestry perspective, speaking as a forester, that is a very good thing to do because you're growing all kinds of little green trees. They're going to allow you to cut more up front, and you're going to have wood down the road. That's what they do. And, and again, you can't fault them for it because it's very good science, it's very, it works well. But it changes what's growing out on the ground. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so what happened over time? So things were going along, we were managing deer, doing everything we thought was right. And in 2003, I had a call from a, a guy down in Charlotte County. And he said, hey Rod, I, I have a camp out on the McAdavie River and we have no deer. I said, well, it's not rocket science. If you have no deer, what's well, something must be wrong. You know, deer need habitat, need food. If there's no food, there's no deer. So I went to our habitat guys and I said, fellas, what, how, what's going on down in Charlotte County? The guy's calling saying that there's uh, no deer down there. So what do we have for food? And they get out their maps, got a great, great big map out and said, oh, there's, uh, oh, there's 40 different cuts here in the last five years. There's a ton of deer food down there. No problem. Case dismissed. 
But rather than being just a regular government guy, he said, no, well, I'm going to go down and I'm going to skidoo those and see what's there. So that winter, we took a couple of skidoos, me and a, another biologist, and we skidooed every one of those cuts. And we said, what's growing there? Now, the interesting thing was, <clears throat> they assumed there was all kinds of browser, but when we looked at it, 67, almost 70% of the regenerating areas were plantations. And they weren't these plantations, that, and I got in this argument with this doctor on the radio who knows a lot of stuff about regenerating forests, that say that all these hardwoods bounce back. Really? Well, I challenged him to go out and look through our plantations and see where these are all bouncing back, because there are no hardwoods in our plantations, because we nuke them. We get rid of them, we kill them all, because we want to grow those little green trees. If it didn't work, we wouldn't do it. And your taxpayers' dollars are paying for that, just by the way. Anyhow, so 67% of the regen were plantations, 95% stocked with evergreen, 16% were poor sites. And that means they were wet sites, they were rocky sites, they were on the top of a mountain, they were some place that they thought, we're not going to grow evergreen trees there because it's too hard to harvest it down the road, so they left it. And then 17% was what I would call the good old fashioned clear cuts that had a lot of hardwood in it that would support a deer population. So I came back and told the guys, I said, holy smokes guys, you, you said there's a ton of browse down there, we're missing the boat. And he said, oh, thanks a lot, Rod, thanks. We're, things are good. So that was in 2003, next slide please. The other thing I did as a deer biologist is we flew and counted deer and moose every year. And we flew 10 wildlife management zones, almost uh, 2,000 uh, 2, square, uh, square kilometer blocks, all over the province. And the interesting thing was as we started flying this, and you can talk to Barry uh, Grant down at the Canadian Helicopters right down here in Lincoln. He, he's done it with us for years and he's seen the same changes and he's not a biologist at all, but he'll tell you what he's seen over years, over the, over the, the years. And we'd be flying along, your deer here, moose there, and all of a sudden, it'd be quiet in the chopper. Nothing. I'd look down and we should find over plantation. Surprise, surprise. So every now and then you see a squirrel go or a rabbit go, but that was all we saw. And we did this year in year. And after a while, the, the, the observers, once we got to a plantation, they'd start stretching, drink their drink, and I said, Geez, what are you doing, guys? You gotta look at no, there's nothing in these in these uh, plantations, I'd say. And that uh, was right. If you go back and look at all of our data, we've got almost 20 years of that data and shows that there's no deer in those areas. Even though we're told by some people that there's all kinds of deer out there in these plantations. Well, I like to see it. Anyhow, I mentioned that again to our senior people. Said, guys, you know, we're fine. There's nothing out there in these places. Yeah, yeah, everything's great. Everything's, everything's fine. Next slide, please. Um, so what, what I said is, well, they're not listening to me. So there must be some other way we can look at this so they realize that we're changing the amount of food out there on Crown Land. Because the other thing we started noticing um, in the last time they tried to grab all this uh, forest was in 2009-10, uh, uh, and uh, when Sean Green was in, and, and they they went out, actually, Sean Green would have given them down 18%, uh, just, just, just so you're aware of that. Because everybody thinks, you know, we'll change color and everything will be fine. Well, I'm telling you, it what wouldn't have been fine if he'd have stayed in a little bit longer, he'd have given them 18%. <laughs> and I know that. I was there. I heard the numbers. I know what went on. And, and don't be fooled here saying, oh, that's not true, because it is. I was there. I heard it. So. Um, I said, there, there's got to be something here. So I went upstairs to our forest man, and people said, you guys must have something on regenerating forest up here. Oh, you get all kinds of data. Hey, you wouldn't even send that down. We just, sure, Excel file, down it came. So I went through it all. Had a little bit of time. So what's going on here? So I started looking at it. They collected a lot of data from 1990 through uh, present day. But the only thing was, there was uh, we were missing data from 2003 to 2006. And then after 2006, no one had, no one had the time then to... Uh, uh, cover type at all to see what was growing there in these new plantations, in these new uh, cut areas. So I looked at what was available from 1990 to 2002. There was 19,000 stands, not a bad sample size, and there was almost 200,000 hectares of uh, forest to look at. So uh, I started looking at potential deer browse. We can see here that uh, back in the late 80s, there was usually everything that was coming back was coming back naturally. There was all kinds of deer browse, and all of a sudden things dropped off when we started. And you remember the uh, herbicide graph went up like this. Well, this graph goes down like that. Surprise, surprise. All of a sudden, the amount of deer browse dropped off the map. Next slide, please. Now, whenever you'd ask them, what's going on with the herbicide? And they'll say, oh, it's not an issue. We only sprayed 1%. It's just, just 1%. Doesn't matter. It's not a big deal. So I thought, well, 1%, what's 1%? Well, 1% actually happens to be quite a bit. It's 1% of crown land. But it's a whole lot more when you start looking at it by year. So if you really push the forcers, they'd say, well, we spray 25% of what we cut. He said, well, that's a little bit higher. But I thought, is it 25%? So I looked at the numbers and I said, well, if you actually look at all the stands, and this is these 19,000 stands, if you look at the number of stands, it's actually almost 30%. And 
And if you look at the area, and again, it's all, it's all plain with numbers. If you look at the amount of area that's clear cut, it's 35 to 40% of the whole area that's cut. Now, all of a sudden, that's a whole lot different than 1%. We're getting up around 50% of what's cut is actually being treated. Next slide, please. So when I started looking at it, I found that they, they, not, they not only uh, plant these uh, clear cut areas, they also fill plant. If they go out and, and it's not fully stocked, they'll go in and put little green trees in to make sure it's fully stocked. So that's called fill planting. Full planting is a pumpkin orange there. That's the one that uh, they do, that we see all the time. And then uh, there's other spots that have less than 40% deer browse. That's in yellow. And I started looking at it saying, well, what's growing on this site? And if you get a spot that's an ericaceous and it's coming back with uh, jack pine and all this stuff, it's not good for deer. So there was actually only 39%, 39.6%, around 40% of what we're cutting out there now that grows back that might be favorable for deer. Might be. But no one's ever gone out and looked at it and said, what's growing there? What did deer eat? What's growing there? Is it good for deer? We're just, they're always assuming that there's 40%. There should be tons of stuff out there for deer. Well, how do you know? Go measure it. <clears throat> Anyhow, next slide, please. So I said, I got to put this in terms that people will understand because they're not getting it. We're, we're losing all this food out there across Crown land. There's no deer out there anymore. There's got to be a reason for it. Deer need food. So when I started looking at it, I realized, okay, well, deer eat two kilograms of food a day. Um, so that's about a ton of food per year per deer. We treat 13,000 hectares of these, plant, of these uh, cut areas every year. So that's 32,000 acres treated with glyphosate annually. And glyphosate works well. They spray it in August, September, because then the softwood buds have hardened and they won't die. If you sprayed this glyphosate earlier in the year, it would kill everything, kill the softwoods and everything. But they spray it in uh, August, September, so that the buds are closed in the softwood trees and they don't die, but all the hardwoods do. So research suggests, and I looked all this up, and it's, all this research is there, it's, there's a ton of it out there. And, and that's why nobody's argued this. I've been spe spewing this for about a year now, and nobody's arguing it because they know these are the, the facts. They can't dispute it. 20 to 40,000 stems per hectare of uh, deer browse on untreated sites, if you don't spray it. So that equates to about 32,000 <coughs> tons of deer food sprayed every year by herbicides. So we're taking away enough deer food every year by the spray program to feed 32,000 deer every year. Hmm, did that have an effect on deer? Hmm. Uh, maybe. 32,000 deer, 32,000 tons of deer food gone every year. And it's occurred for over 20 years in the province. Next slide, please. So, the other thing I found out, we went to a funding model force meeting just before I, I left DNR in 2012. And there was a guy there, one of their researchers, and we started talking about site index. And uh, we talked about, because there was people that were saying, you guys have got to stop changing these beautiful hardwood stands, uh, mature hardwood stands, taller and hardwoods, and change them over plantations. That's terrible. Oh, well, we don't do that. They said, oh, there's rules that say you can't do that. So we said, well, well why does it happen? No, 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 well, but we can do it to mix stands. Well, what's the thing? Oh, if there's one soft tree in there, it's mixed wood. <laughs> oh, well, well then, it's a mixed wood stand, so let's plant all kinds of, they said, yeah, those stands, they're really rich. They have a really high, high site index. We love to put plantations on these high site index sites because our trees grow so well. And I thought, not only are they planting 40% of the area, they're planting the best stuff out there on Crown land. Like, that's what they're doing to it. So, next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> so, what did I do? Well, I, of course, I started telling this to my, to my people that I work with and saying, listen, we've got to wake up here. There's something going on. And, I kept getting the hand, and you know, thanks a lot. And, you know. uh, again, we had a we had a, a deputy minister then that Sean Graham hired, who happened to work for uh, for a pretty prominent portrait company, and uh, they had other plans, so they didn't want to listen to me. Um, so, anyways, I looked at all this, and I, and I said, "This is amazing." So I wrote it all up. I wrote it all up on the paper. I, everything I did at DNR, and you can go up there and look at them. I wrote 20 different deer technical reports. I wrote uh, 13 or 14 fur bear technical reports. Everything I did, I wrote down. As I said, somebody someday is going to want to look at why did you do this? Why did you do that? So I wrote it all down, it's all there. So I wrote all this stuff up. And uh, a neat thing I found when I started writing this up, I did a little bit of research, and all the wildlife research said that uh, glyphosate, or herbicides, are beneficial for deer. I thought, what? I couldn't believe it. I written a, and there was a paper, and again, I was on CBC arguing this with, uh, with the great doctor, and, and uh, in 20, two, two, 2004 was the latest paper that said herbicide was good for deer. And I read all through that, thought, are you kidding me? And they, oh, that was based on a study they did back in 2002. So I went back to the 2002 study. And it was a summary they did, Lautenschlager and his, and his buddy Sullivan. And they looked at all this research and they said, oh yeah, well, it's beneficial for deer. And, I said, and so I went through all the individual papers that they had cited to look at what, what they were saying about deer. And, and there was three papers that talked about deer. 
One was roe deer in France. One was black-tailed deer in Oregon. And one was deer in Maine. I thought, well, that's pretty close, but they never looked at the deer. The de they didn't actually look at a live deer and see if it actually ate what they did. So three papers, and because of that, they're saying herbiciding is good for deer. I said, you gotta be kidding me. So then I looked at the four, being a forester, I looked at all the forestry-based research. It was unbelievable. Glyphosate kills, it's the best thing out there. Keep using glyphosate, it's phenomenal. And I thought, well, that makes sense, because that's what we see in New Brunswick. Anybody here ever walk through plantations? There is nothing in there but little green trees, or big green trees, so it doesn't matter what, how, what age it is. So I said, that makes a whole lot more sense. And then, of course, I found a couple of these papers that were uh, published. Well, they gave all kinds of uh, credence to uh, Monsanto. Thank you very much for your funds to uh, fund our study of Monsanto. I thought, holy mackerel, those guys manufacture herbicide. What's going on here? And, and the more I looked into it, I was amazed that there's a, there's a lot of funny stuff going on up there. So anyways, my senior guys, they, they looked at that paper and they threw that as far as they could. But all the field staff that are out there every day tromping through the woods, they looked at that and said, we've been saying this for years. You're right on the money, Cumberland. You're right on the money. And of course, I'd flown it. I knew what was going on. So when I started talking about this stuff, um, of course, some people weren't too happy about it. But I get calls all the time from DNR staff all over the province. Right on, keep pounding that drum. We've been saying it for years. It's fallen on deaf ears. So I'm, I know I'm on the right path. Not even only from the science, but because all the staff out there that are looking at this see it as well. Next slide, please. So the only thing is, when I started talking about uh, glyphosate and, and the herbicide and the effect it had, <clears throat> all of a sudden people started calling me. Get people from all over the world. And I thought, what's going on here? They said, man, if you're onto something, they said, we've been looking at this, you would not believe what the research shows on glyphosate. So I started looking more because glyphosate right now with the, uh, the Health Canada is reviewing it again to say whether they're gonna allow us. Because see, every time we say, you shouldn't use glyphosate to DNR or to urban, they'll say, oh no, Health Canada says it's great to use. They'll stand right behind Health Canada. Oh, Health Canada says it's great to use. So I went up to Health Canada, what, what's going on here? Why is this so good? Well, well we're, we're reviewing it. It's all in the review, it's all in the review. So I started looking at the science and said, well, what are they reviewing? So I started looking online and, man, I could not believe it. The original research they did with glyphosate, it was very short term, 30 days. And, it's, it, and they were looking for acute toxicity. Well, acute toxicity means you drink it, you die. Okay? So, and, and there's guys that have taken it before. Look, look, beat, doesn't kill you. It's great. Well, that's fine. But there's a researcher over in France because they wanted to use this stuff. Monsanto has got, you would not believe it. You should look up, uh, was it Food Inc.? You, you want to watch that documentary, type it in Food Inc. and watch that documentary, it'll change your life. Anyhow, when they, uh, when they were testing this over in France, they hired a, a researcher and he said, okay, well, we'll test it before they can use it in France. We tested it on mice, like they always do. And 30 days, oh, everything's fine. No acute toxicity. So, summarize it up, write it up, and send it out. Your, re your research uh, results. Anyways, this guy kept the mice, the mice going. I said, oh, I want to look at this a little bit more. And we just heard about this. Wherever, I, I see a couple of people in the audience have heard about this over at the uh, Fredericton Community Garden. They brought some guys in to talk about this. And they followed those mice for another 90 days. And guess what? The cancerous growth and stuff on those mice is unbelievable. It's grotesque to see what happened to those mice. The other thing they did when they first started testing glyphosate, they would just test glyphosate itself. But glyphosate in formulation is in with all kinds of these emulsifiers and, and adjuvants that make it stick to the plants and do what it does. And they never tested with all those things together. Now, in the last few years, they've been testing it all together. It's a thousand times more toxic than it was just on its own. And man, they are panicking now that this stuff's getting out there. Because they know they say, all of a sudden this beautiful thing that they've used for years and years, it is bad news. And people, it's not just being sprayed on our forests. It's being sprayed on our food. And there's no labels on your food. You don't know what you're eating. You know what they do now? All your wheat products. You want to buy their uh, gluten intolerance and it's going right through the roof? It's because before they harvest their wheat out west, they spray it all, they nuke it with glyphosate a week before they harvest it. I'm telling you people that this will be the biggest issue in, in our generation, glyphosate. It's, I, the more I read, the scare, more scared I got. I thought, I gotta get out of here because everybody, the agriculture guys are gonna wanna hang me, everybody's gonna wanna hang me. I'm not doing it, I'm just telling you, I just read the research, it's unbelievable. So, and it's gonna, be, it's gonna get big. But we're still spraying it out there, we spray it on 13,000, uh, hectares of a forest every year. Next slide, please. So, in, in the 2000s, we had, remember, 31 to 35 percent of the crown land set aside. And even though we set all that stuff aside, our deer numbers did this on crown land. Even though we had 35 percent, and of course, the only thing we looked at was deer yards, because we thought that's what we're going to lose. Nobody was even thinking about regenerating forest and all those little harvests. Nobody, that wasn't even on the map. And our, and our deer numbers went, 
Okay, and then all of a sudden, in, in 2012, Northrop has to come up and make a decision, and hats off to Northrop, he had the guts to ask his staff what they thought, he asked other people what they thought, and he said 28% is as low as he can go. It gave the forestry companies a little bit, but it didn't give them the farm. He actually asked our staff, and, and there's a lot of people in DNR bent out of shape saying this is not sustainable, don't give them any more than, than you need to, and he actually told our staff, he said, write to me directly. In 22 years with government, I've never been told to write to my minister directly without getting reprimanded by somebody above me. First time ever. And based on all that data, Northrop made a great decision. Or better than the one we have now. In 2014, they announced what they did, and I was shocked. No public input, no stakeholders, no DNR staff, and you have not heard from them at all, because they're all muzzled. And when Dave Kuhn got that little piece of paper that he got on the, the agreement, IT people went all through their offices out there looking for who leaked that information. And I, I'm telling you, and we, I, I can give you all kinds of examples here tonight of people that have had a big change in their job because they've said stuff contrary to this. <clears throat> and I was the next one on the list, but I left before they got a chance to get a hold of me. <laughs> now, the other thing that, the two things that really, uh, next slide please. <clears throat> I already mentioned the deer yards. We're in this huge debate over this force that we set aside for wildlife and, and, for, and for old growth, and we shouldn't even be, be debating it. All this wood is available on private woodlots. It's all there. Everything they need to meet their demands. But they don't want to pay for it. They are getting crown land, crown wood, for peanuts. For nothing. We pay, if they cut on crown land, we pay them to build a road. Your taxpayers' dollars paid to put the road in there to get it. We pay them, we pay to fight the fires out there. We pay to plant it, we pay to spray the toxins on it. Taxpayers' dollars pay for all of that. That's why we're losing money on our forest. And they know that. They know they can not only get the wood for nothing, they can also then get all this other stuff done for nothing. They're not going to pay the private pri 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 lot guys. <laughs> we're making money. Are you silly? We're going to go. And again, they've got them where they want them. They're getting exactly what they want. So these changes came about very slowly over time. But looking back now, it's very obvious what happened. And I hope you see that. The thing that really bought why I'm here. I, I've got a lot better things to do than come to, to something like this, I can tell you that. However, what really ticked me off is when we start, well, I started saying something about this, people got ticked for it. Who are you to speak to this? What? I'm a flipping wildlife biologist. <laughs> well, well, hey. Oh, oh, you, well, you don't know anything. Your research is up, your research is up to lunch. <laughs> My research is the inner data, for the love of Pete. That, that ticked me off. All of a sudden, we've got people with scientists that know something about what's going on out there, and now we can't speak to it? Are you nuts? Where, where, where do you think we're, li we're living in Canada, people? Hello? And then, and then the other thing, they don't want the public, they don't want you guys talking about your, your forest, crown land. Oh, hey, yeah, don't you? We don't want to know what you think. We're making all kinds of money here off that. We don't care what you think. People, wake up. I don't know how long we're going to let them tell us that we can't have any input to this process. I'm a forester just like they are. And people that have the experience and the expertise should be able to speak to this issue. That should be a bell ringing in your ear saying something is wrong if you can't have the uh, scientists in this province and 184 of them wrote a letter saying this is a bad deal, that this is a wrong way to go on this whole forestry thing. It's ignored. What would it appear? In one paper? Oh, yeah, that's because they own the papers! Wake up! <laughs> on our own time trying to get the message out to a few people. I know we're preaching the converted here, but maybe there are a few of you that don't know this tonight, and hopefully you will go out and tell some other people. Because the average urbanite has got to get it. They don't care about what goes on in the forest. If it doesn't affect their backyard, they don't. Envy power was a big deal because it affected them. Oh, Andy, they don't sell any power. That affects me. This year, they don't think it affects them. Well, I'll tell you, it does affect us. It affects every one of us. And if you're concerned about what your kids eat and what's sprayed out there in the ground and where your kids are going to be able to walk in a few years, not through a flipping plantation from one of this province to the other, we've got to wake up and stop this. And this, and this is just the deer end of it. There, there's all kinds of other issues as far as how they're managing the forest, what they're doing in the Acadia forest. There's a ton of things. Even the economics is totally out of whack. But n that none of that message is getting out because they've captured the media. You can't get anything out there. The St. Croix Courier is one of the only people that will print anything because they don't own them. And what's the other one? Katie Nouvelle? The only two in the province. People, you are in the dark. Not just here. Right now. You're in the dark on this issue. And we need to wake up and get the message out there. Um, anyhow, I better shut up and let somebody else talk. <laughs> Thank you very much.
takes a lot of guts, it really does, to stand up. But when you think of your children, the decision is easy, right? No Thanks again. My right. pleasure. Thank you. It is a mess. We are in a mess. We are in a state of control. I'm going to show you a little video of, of, of someone else who's approached me and said, I'd like to participate. But yes, I got some information. Someone sent me. A former MB Power exec. And he says, I've got enough of this. I'm tired. I'm sorry. Here's some information. Let's see if we can talk. And it, it's in a jargon, I had to call a lot of people to say, can you, can you make me understand what I have here? But basically it's this. The government decided a while back ago, listen, we're going to invest like $500 million to buy green energy. Okay? So here's the plan. You see, we have a forest, and it's being cut, and they do a lot of chipping. And what, what the government decided is we're going to buy energy created by burning chips. So who's got the capability to do it? Well, of course, Irving has the capability to do it, and, and AV Cell, and I think there's another one. So what's been happening is this. You see, they chip all this wood, and they pay the province for one metric ton, they pay the province something like $2.64. But see, on the regular market, it's $90 a metric ton. But somehow the province has agreed $2.64 is fine. Now, that metric ton has a value in energy of $175. So once it's turned into electricity, it's worth $175. So I'll use Irving as an example. So Irving gets a metric ton for $2.60, burns it, creates the energy, the province buys it for 9.6 a kilowatt, and then turns around and sells it back to the Irvings for 5 cents a kilowatt. Okay. <laughs> so when you look at it, that's a 4.6 cent uh, subsidy. So if Irvin takes that $5 a kilowatt, takes out 4.6, he's actually paying 0.4 cents a kilowatt for the electricity. And he's complaining, hey, it's too expensive. And we're gonna have to do something, you know, because it's way too expensive. He's, we're subsidizing them this way. Now I got this information yesterday. Somehow I have to make it, I have to make it come out in such a way. I have to make sure first I get my ass watched that. And I'm not saying something stupid here. But the fact that you have an exec coming up with that basically is telling you that we are really under control. That our government is not watching out for us. Initially I started my whole series and the first people that I talked to were uh, university historians who made their, their doctoral dissertations on the state of New Brunswick's forest and they said, listen, New Brunswick is a uh, a client state. They said, both of them said that. New Brunswick is a client state, meaning that the industry has more control over the resources than the province does. Now I'd like to bring up uh, Don Bowser. Don Bowser contacted me as well, and he said, Charles, I've got this background that may be interesting. He says, I've, uh, I've worked overseas for 25 years. I'm a uh, transparency and anti-corruption expert. I've worked in all of the hot spots in the world dealing with those governments and I'd like to participate. So I'd like to bring on Don Bowser and I think we're about ready now to hear what he has to tell us. Well we don't know about that. <laughs> Thanks Charles. And I love uh, having Rod on the show with us uh, because usually I'm the scary guy uh, but Rod scares the hell out of me. <laughs> so what I want to talk a little bit about is, is corruption. And uh, I represent uh, an NGO here in the Maritimes called Impact that deals with anti-corruption issues, transparency and accountability. And I've been doing anti-corruption work around the globe for about 16, 17 years now. Uh, next slide. 
So my story uh, and why my story is a little bit important because as Rod talked about with the frog, I've been out of the pot for a very long time. So when I left Canada uh, in the early 90s and I went to study in the Soviet Union and then sort of stuck around Europe and, and other places, things were fairly functioning. Okay, yes, there were some, some <coughs> strange things that sometimes occurred in New Brunswick, but things were you know, relatively humming along. Um, and then every summer I'd come back and you would see little snapshots of what was going on, but you really didn't see the increase in the temperature in the water. So I, I, when I uh, moved back uh, more or less permanently in 2006 to a little place in the backwoods of Albert County, I uh, started seeing all this economic activity going on. And it was very strange for me because there was no public discussions. There was nothing that happens in the extractive industries anywhere else in the world. You cannot go into a place and start economic activity without talking to the local people. They won't tolerate it. <coughs> So I started off working on privatization issues and then went from privatization to looking at shadow economy and shadow economy led me to corruption. And since 1997, I'm pretty much stuck with looking at corruption, uh, organized crime, and a little bit at, at terrorism and other violent non-state actors. And when I started to look at what was going on in New Brunswick, it really shocked me. Because I had seen exactly the same things occur in Russia and Eastern Europe. The tunneling out of assets, leaving the state with a load of debt, and taking every good that was available. So people look at this and they say, from outside, and they say, how can this happen in Canada? In fact, Charles and I uh, went to Moncton uh, on last Thursday before our St. John show. And we met with two, two UK researchers. And they were scratching their head. They said, the more that we learn about what goes on in New Brunswick, we can't believe that this is actually occurring in Canada. He said, welcome to New Brunswick. That's the way it is, right? The unbelievable can always happen. So when I came back and I, in 2006, I had just been in Afghanistan uh, and had done my sort of first stint in Afghanistan uh, and saw what was going on. But still, there was this drive towards greater transparency. Right? The Taliban have been winning the war because they're able to hit about the corruption issue. So the government started to wake up a little bit about this in Afghanistan. Uh, and coming back and seeing what was going on in terms of the extractive industries, I was really surprised that there could be these enormous efforts made to extract oil, gas, even uranium, and whatever else, with a zero degree of public consultation. And it, uh, it really struck me as, as not being in Canada, but being someplace in Central Asia. Next slide. So, corruption. And I wanted to be a little bit more interactive uh, with this session. So what is corruption for the audience? All word. All word. Well, is he making any money off this? But how is it corrupt? What is corruption? There is no choice. Okay. They misrepresent. No choice. As Rod Cumberland said, it doesn't matter if you're liberal or you're conservative, both have sold out. They have no interest of the people at heart. Sure. So you want to see the manipulation? Yeah. Of abuse of authority, abuse of one's position. Right. So it, it, it really comes down to that. And actually, what I've done is, uh, uh, every place that I've worked, I've gone out and asked these same questions. Started off in Sierra Leone, uh, just after the war, and went out and asked people, what is corruption for you? And everywhere that I've gone, whether it be Central Asia, Southeast Asia, North America, Europe, people always come up with relatively the same definition. Corruption is the misuse or abuse of authority that I don't benefit from. So when you ask people and they say, well, what is corruption? They say, well, it's ministers misusing their office. And they said, well, if they give you a job, oh, no, that's not corruption. Absolutely not. <laughs> eh, it might be wrong, but I'm a beneficiary, and therefore they don't see it. So it's always a very personal thing, right? What is corruption? And what do people see as corruption? Who do we see as being corrupt besides all of them? Judges. Judges? 
Are the judges in Canada corrupt? Can you buy a decision in New Brunswick? Easily. Influence one. Influence. And that's a very good point. Who else? Bureaucrats. Bureaucrats, like? Yeah. Yeah. Do we see some government departments as more corrupt than others? The firemen. Well, if, if the firemen are corrupt, we're all in trouble. Okay. Environment. Yes. Environment. So natural resources. Who else? I work in academia, uh, and so uh, I'll, keep, I'll keep mute on that point. Um, I think we're fairly lucky in Princeton, but sometimes the police. Yes. Yeah. Well, well, with Charles the blogger here, we know that that's going to come up, <laughs> right? But yet, if we look at it, do we see that corruption occurs at street-level bureaucrats? Can you buy a driver's license here? Can you buy any sort of uh, license that you need to do things? Buy it? Probably not. Can you influence uh, permits? Yes. Building permits? Absolutely. Like say, mega campgrounds <laughs> in lovely spots in the southeastern part of this province? Or a uh, uh, high school uh, on a uh, golf course? Yeah, yeah exactly. So there are areas that are more vulnerable to, to others. And why I'm asking this is because it helps us identify actually what corruption is. And why I, I, I'm doing this is because I see that sometimes uh, it's very interesting what people perceive to be corruption here uh, and what people don't perceive to be corruption. When I started talking about this, people said, oh, come on, it's not really corruption. Right? Do we have corruption in New Brunswick? Yeah. And every audience has said the same thing. Oh, yes. A lot of people tend to turn their head away from the, the presence of so much nepotism as well. Yeah. Wherever there are human activities, you will find corrupt. That's right. And wherever there is a mixture of private and public business, there is corruption. So why do we find those departments to be vulnerable to corruption? Natural resources, license. There's an economic advantage, right? It's almost always where somebody can make a buck off it. Right? There is an abuse of authority just because people want to rough people up uh, to take away their civil liberties. Now, we've seen it in some cases, but it's not really the pattern that corruption is used or abuse of authority is used to keep people um, from assembling together. We've had a couple of incidences. And one of the things that people don't realize is there was more political violence in New Brunswick in the 1980s than there was in Northern Ireland. Right? And Charles has some great stories about what's happened in Kedgewick with blowing up of helicopters and people, you know, people just don't put up with a lot of this stuff after a while. So there is a strong will to stand up. Next slide. Yeah. Absolutely. So, I'm sorry, since, I'm sorry. Uh, would you please tell me this again? Uh, the degree of, of corruption in New Brunswick. Um, nobody knows because nobody's been able to measure it. We can't even get public meetings yeah. on issues such as the. It's immense. It's immense. I've traveled all around the world by a journalist. The corruption here exceeds that that I've seen in Eastern Europe when I've been advising the president. But this is the worst I've ever seen. The single family rules the entire province. Yeah. It's a hierarchy. It's a genetic hierarchy. The people are undereducated by purpose. If you open your mouth, you're expelled, as I was from UNB, and you will you will spend the rest of your life here fighting unless people get together and make their own media first. In all these meetings, in these secret closed rooms in the dark, where the general public, whatever number of tens of thousands of people in the city are not present, are a 
proof positive that we're going the wrong way. Yep, and we'll get to that later in my presentation. <laughs> Let me just get through a little bit of this, right? So corruption is usually defined as the misuse of public office for private gain. So if we look at that and we look at the private gain that happens, we see quite a bit of it. Corruption is usually considered just to be bribery. So when you talk about corruption, people say, well, you know, there isn't the payoffs. And that's right. There's not actually a lot of political figures in New Brunswick making fortunes. I've always said that the motto of our public figures in New Brunswick should be, we, are not, we'll, we will not be undersold. <laughs> we come no cheaper. We will give you what you want, but we don't ask anything really in return. Promises of board memberships later on, but we will not be undersold. And that's what's staggering. And actually what I've been doing over the last few weeks is looking at what are the payoffs? Who gets board appointments later? Who gets choice positions? And so when we start to look at this, it's not really um, you know, a lot of former ministers driving around in really high-end vehicles. You get a few key players benefit, but really most politicians don't. So the question is, why are they selling themselves? Why are they selling out to corporate interests? What's the benefit? Can they just be in co they want to hold their pensions? But yeah, but a pension really, I mean, selling your soul, you know, for peanuts. Uh, yeah, but you know, it's, it's when you look at it, it's, that's for me the most surprising part. In other parts of the world, you, they know what it costs to buy a minister. They know what the benefit is. But here, really, where are the real benefits? But corruption also includes nepotism, patronage, fraud, theft of public resources, political party financing, collusion, right? All of those aspects are also corruption. And if we look at that, we see actually there's quite a bit of corruption going on, right? Do relatives of New Brunswick politicians benefit? So say, just hypothetically, a sister of a minister <laughs> worked for a company that kind of does stuff related to what the minister does. Is that conflict of interest? Or say if the, you know, the top of the chain, the, the big dog's dad, uh, has a little company that gets a little bit of largesse from the province, is that corruption? No, he said they never discussed business. And he didn't know what his old man was doing. That's the best part. <laughs> so although they may not be corrupt, he was a but he, you know, if they may not be corrupt, they definitely don't have family values. And I do not understand why that was not brought up in the legislature. You don't know what your old man is doing? Seriously? I don't know if my old man is out in the audience because I can't see anybody, but he promised he would be. But uh, I usually know what he's up to. Just watch your vote. <laughs> yeah, there he is. <laughs> right? So, corruption has two levels. Administrative corruption and political corruption. The small, petty bureaucrat corruption of being able to go in and buy a driver's license or buy an access to service really doesn't exist. But the grand corruption exists and exists everywhere. There's no place in the world that doesn't suffer from grand corruption. Uh, and people have been talking about how great open uh, governments are and how great in Estonia it is. And even in Estonia they have a problem with, uh, with corruption at the grand level. There's no place that doesn't. Because anywhere where you get public and private interest meeting, you're going to have corruption. Everywhere that somebody can make a decision and not be held accountable, you'll have corruption. So that's why there's actually a very nice formula uh, developed by Robert Clickgard, uh, who worked at the World Bank and other places, and, and Bob uh, came up with this formula that corruption is C equals M plus D minus A. It's monopoly plus discretion minus accountability. So being able to make decisions without being held accountable for them is the staggering part, right? That's how corruption occurs. Are decisions made in New Brunswick behind closed doors? <coughs> Absolutely. Look at the forestry. Right? So this was done. 
And really the problem right now in shale gas and everything else is all done in this great opaque system that nobody can look into because we don't have access to information. Well, that's, that's purposeful. Yeah, it is indeed. <laughs> Next slide. So when I started looking at this, uh, there's a great theory that was developed by the guys at the World Bank who looked at Russia and Eastern Europe in the 1990s, and they called it state capture. And what it means is that companies write the rules. And they write the rules only to benefit them. It's how that they can create more monopolies. So a company, once it's able to influence policymakers, is essentially able to create a monopoly because they will manipulate the entire system to only benefit themselves. So it's laws, it's policies, it's the whole rest of it. And it differs from ordinary political corruption. Right? It's fundamentally different. It's not about taking a payoff. It's about creating a system in which you are the only player. And then you can bring the politicians in. Or they're included from the very start and they, they accept a payoff. Next slide. So when we take this, and you know, I argued with Joel Hellman and Danny Kaufman at the World Bank about this because it really didn't apply to, to Russia or Ukraine. Because the same people that were running companies were actually civil servants. And we don't have too much of that in, uh, in New Brunswick, right? The odd exceptions, maybe a Minister of Finance, for example, that uh, comes in. But really, it isn't like, you know, uh, somebody from that monopoly that we're not allowed to name. And uh, I always say it's like Harry Potter. You know, he who should not be named. It's not like they're actually going in and running the office and becoming minister. Well, we don't see their names there. So the influence that happens is behind the scenes. It's the facade. And so what we have in New Brunswick is province capture. And province captures occurred when certain monopolies are able to make decisions for the province that only benefit them. And that's what for me is extremely depressing, is that these decisions occur opaquely and there seems to be no process put in place. What passes for a white paper in New Brunswick is a glossy brochure with a bit of infographics. The oil and gas blueprint, 10 pages, of which if you extract all the nice pictures out, is three pages of text. The forest strategy as well. A couple of nice, uh, and you know, kudos to the GNB uh, publishing guys because they do a fantastic job of making everything look glossy and nice and you know, kids smiling in the forest and everything else. <laughs> but there's no text there. There's no details on any of this stuff. What passes for a royalty regime in New Brunswick in the oil and gas blueprint is one line. Now, okay, I understand it was written by a guy who faked his PhD. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and, and kudos, uh, kudos uh, to, to said individual because you know, it's not, he should be doing ads now for Walden. Uh, you know, I drew the turtle head on the matchbox and sent it in and look at me, I become a government advisor. <laughs> But the same sources of information about the economic side of all of this, the royalties, the revenues, and everything else, is essentially gobbledygook. You can put out things that say there are indirect jobs, thousands of indirect jobs. Well, I can say that our performance here today has created three, four indirect jobs here at the Playhouse. Would those same people be employed by the Playhouse if we were here or not? Of course it would. Would somebody at Tim Hortons be employed selling coffee if they aren't servicing the guy from the, uh, from the shale gas rigs? Of course they would. That's not an indirect job. That's just a job that benefits, maybe, but it's not really a full-time equivalent job. So there's a lot of nonsense in these numbers. And the whole system doesn't stand up because there's no transparency. And so everywhere in the world now, governments are forced to publish the information about the contracts that they write with private companies. Afghanistan's mining law is a paragon of transparency in comparison to New Brunswick's. <laughs> and it was written by some very nice Canadian lawyers who sat in Kabul, and I had some chats with them, and I said, can you guys come to New Brunswick and help us out a little bit? <laughs> right? But it's unbelievable. 
Yeah, I was just in Mongolia, and in Mongolia, within 72 hours, they have to publish every decision made by government. It has to go up, it has to be transparent. And I was tell, I asked the president of Mongolia, will you come to Canada and lecture us about transparency? I want to see you give it to Harper and say, listen, you guys really need to get your act together, okay? You really, because you're just going down the tubes, because the entire Mongolian economy is dependent on Canadian mining companies. And they've taken them several times to task and said, no, rewrite the agreement. This is unfair. This was corruption. You paid off people to get this agreement. And they were told, oh, no, no, no. You guys will be, that'll be it. Nobody will come and invest here. And they said, really? Shall we ask the Chinese? Shall we ask somebody else? Not a problem. Lots of companies out there. And if we look at the resources that are actually available, New Brunswick sits on the world's largest supply of tungsten, Sissenbrook. You're telling me that they really have to give it out to a company with almost no public discussion, open bids? And so it's really staggering that you can get away with this stuff. And everybody's asleep and everybody says, well, you know, I want to keep my job and I better shut my mouth. Right? Same thing that Rod was talking about. So what happens in New Brunswick is the assets are tunneled out for the benefit of companies, not for the province. The province is left with debt. Everything that they do ends up in the province losing money. If they had a worldwide competition for a jurisdiction that does business worst, it would be us. <laughs> Even the little Pacific island of Vanuatu, after they had sold off the entire island, it was nothing but big holes made by mining. They were smart enough to buy another island. <laughs> so they got a little bit of benefits out of them. They said, screw it, let's go. And I think that, you know, if New Brunswick is benefiting and, you know, there's nothing left in the province and we all had to move, buying Turks and Caicos might be an option. <laughs> but that doesn't happen. We don't get anything. So in the great resource giveaway, what happens? Well, all the resources are given away and all the province gets is more debt. How is it possible that you can lose money on every single deal that you do? It's a staggering track record, really, at the end of the day. It's like some bizarro version of Price is Right. <laughs> the Price is Wrong, starting the government of New Brunswick. Have that little guy climbing up the the, the, the hill and then he would slide off down into it into the, the depths and it's been going on for a very long time and uh, because I'm a good old Albert County boy I like to uh, look at the history of, uh, of Albert County where they discovered the second place in North America where they took out uh, hydrocarbons and basically where we invented the the, uh, the oil and gas business in North America and you see the guys never had the same thing he got screwed out of his company because he was told that Albertite wasn't, you know, kerosene, it was actually just coal. And they had a judicial decision which enforced that. So this has been going on, it's not yesterday, it's happened for over 100 years, where the same things happen. The province always ends up getting the not very clean end of the stick. So then you say, well, is that an incredible coincidence, really? Have we had generations of really stupid people in office? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe, but it doesn't seem that that's just by chance, right? There's a limit. I, I know it's hard to believe, but there actually is a limit to stupid people in the world. <laughs> and especially, you know, even in a generational thing and, you know, crossbreeding that occurs in the political elite of New Brunswick, still there's a limit to the number of stupid people that we can put into office. So I don't think that that's really just the case. So the monopoly firms, they manipulate the political and economic system so that only they benefit and only they can access natural resources. And they do it with the cooperation of a few public officials. And I'm not, you know, I don't think that every politician is corrupt. And in fact, I think most of the people that are elected in office in New Brunswick are actually fairly decent. But the problem is, it's do what I say or the people in your constituency <coughs> lose their jobs. So what are you going to do? You're an elected official. What choice do you have? You want to help your constituents. So can you compromise on that? And it's a salami theory. Right? You start losing your integrity slice by slice. And then at one point you realize, wow, look what I've been part of. 
And I think the strongest part of what Charles has done is to get all of these ex-officials to come forward and admit their sins. And I would love to see an official program in which everybody could come in like a, you know, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission of where all of the former politicians that have helped put New Brunswick in the place that it is now would come forward and admit their sins. So at least we could record it, and that's it. You know, you're not going to get punished. But at least come forward and say, well, actually, the evil deeds that you've done. Because it might actually help. And it might wake people up. Next slide. So how do we capture a province? Well, you can do it in six easy steps. I tried for five, doesn't work, you have to do six. Uh, it's like the six minute abs thing, you know, obviously I, I don't uh, participate in any such program, but you know, it's the same sort of concept. How do you capture a province in six easy steps? Well, first of all, you have to keep the economy run by oligarchs. The few. You have to have a few major companies. And it works because it's far easier to make a decision among a few bodies rather than a lot. If we had a genuine free market in which you had a lot of companies competing, what would happen? Well, it would be very hard to make those collusion agreements. To say, you get this piece and I get that piece. Sometimes they fight, but really, if you're still around by now, you've pretty much got the, the game down. And it's really no different than the robber barons in the 19th century, right? How were the railways built? Well, it was built by a bunch of nasty guys that made deals among themselves. And so we look at this and we say, oh, well, we've moved on, you know, oh, capitalism is now, you know, not the way it used to be. But you look at those Russian oligarchs, those are really bad guys, and the Russian oligarchs always respond, you're telling us about how to do dirty business? That's how you guys made, that's how your whole capitalist system was built, by robber barons. So most places have gone on and moved on beyond that, and they have fairly competitive markets, but here what we have is oligarchs. And don't kid yourself, it's not really that different than Russia or Eastern Europe, really. Because when you meet the guys, and, and you know, Forbes will write a nice article about a guy who made his fortune in Russia and is a smart kid and worked hard, worked his way up. Okay, he had to kill a few people along the way. Right? Or a guy in Cambodia who comes up and owns a major chunk of the economy. Well, he might have had to kill his brother. But, you know, that's just the way that it is. Right? It's not that you have to do that in New Brunswick. But you can definitely be an oligarch and get away with it continually. Because... Nobody wants to be unfriendly to business, right? No politician is going to stand up and say, no, no, we have to really change things, because that would be it, right? Oh, he's unfriendly to business. He's a socialist. Only in the Brunswick are the socialists not really socialists anymore. <laughs> in fact, we had a recent meeting with, uh, with uh, our beloved social democratic person, and he demanded to be recognized as a capitalist. And I think that's great. <laughs> because really, you know, it's not cool to be communist anymore, is it really? It's not cool to be socialist anymore. Nobody wants that. No, no, no. The only way that things work is the neoliberal way. Uh, having seen the excesses of neoliberalism and seen the excesses of it um, when it, when it happened in Eastern Europe, I started to grow a little bit skeptical about really is this the only way. Am I, uh, and I do my PhD in Melbourne, and my professor uh, wrote a great book called The Rotten State, where he takes us on, and he says, giving all of the powers away from the government to private corporations doesn't make things more effective, right? Look at Enron. Look at other major companies. Are they really that effective? But you can still have globalization and not work in a way that actually does damage. Right? It's about efficiency, and there's no proof that actually corporations run things better than state officials. Uh, it may, uh, you may be able to hire brighter people, but if you pay decent salaries in the private sector, you would get decent people in some cases, right? So the other way to do it is control the means of production and natural resources. So you have to control this. And the other way to talk about this would be to talk about warlords. And that's exactly how warlords control Afghanistan. They don't do it by gun, but they go in and they grab a factory, they go and grab a ruby mine, they go and grab a heroin supply, because without having an economic basis, you can't do it. 
Economic power is real power. The power of violence is only illusionary. You can have it, you cannot have it. But being able to employ people means that you, they will constantly be on your side. So if you don't control the means of production or you don't control the natural resources, you really won't be able to control things. And then you have to control the access to information. Right? And that's what makes New Brunswick truly unique in Canada. The concentration of media ownership. And the fact that there is no way to get the word out. Right? Well, Charles left. Where is he? There he is. The voice of the free media in New Brunswick. Charles of Water. And I talked to people who run schools of journalism and I said, study this guy because he's really been able to make the top political figures afraid of him, right? They write memos. Charles is to be treated as a real journalist. <laughs> but he is the only real journalist. That's the problem, right? Two free newspapers and that's it. And you know, God bless CBC for doing what they can, but of course they get the screws put to them. Uh, I did, uh, I did the, uh, I had a sit down with uh, Steve Murphy uh, uh, last week in, uh, on Ukraine. And I made a little jab at them about, about being corporate sponsored as well. Because we were talking about Russia, uh, 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 RTV, uh, Russia Today. And I have friends who, are, who are, have been in it since the start. And you know, their media is absolutely controlled. They're given three days before a crisis, they're giving the script of what they will say. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, Canadian journalists sort of laugh and say, oh, that could never happen here. Right. Okay. Let's go see what, how you're going to report on a story when you know that the, you can have all of your advertisement budget slashed, right? And that's what it's about. The, the for-profit media, of course, are dependent on ads. So, but you have to control access to information. And what's really staggering is that every aspect of access to information in the province is controlled. The only way that we can see contracts that are written is that we have to get the head of the Green Party to launch a court case. When I told the Mongols that, they said, no, no, come on, you're not serious. I said, yeah. They said, but it's not the 1990s in Eastern Europe. I said, yeah, well, yeah God bless us. But you also have to control the political process. And it's not about paying bribes. You control the political process in very subtle ways. And what's been staggering about the shale gas debate recently is that every source of information uh, is quoted from inaccurate information that was presented before. It pops up in government, it pops up in think tanks, it pops up by academics, and it pops up in, in, uh, in articles written. Right? That's how you control things. There is very little real evidence. And that's what I love, is that we have this discussion about the forestry, and we have this discussion about, about hydrocarbons with no data. There's nothing to support it. Right? There's almost no facts and figures. So you say, what is the royalty rate? Well, whew, no idea. Because the province doesn't publish it. The companies publish it in their reports, but that's it. But still you don't have an accurate picture of actually what's going on. And some companies don't publish any of the results. Right? So they're able to hide. And then you have to keep the population poor, and I used to say stupid, but you know, that's not very polite to, to say about us New Brunswickers, because there's a lot of smart New Brunswickers out there that have gone on and done great things and everything else, but are crushed when they're in their own province, but it's badly educated. And the fact is, New Brunswick's functional literacy rate is the worst in Canada. So how do we do that? So how do we, how do we, is that just by, by accident? We don't have good teachers in the Brunswick? No, no, no. We have first grade teachers. And if you were a good teacher, if you were Muslim, because you weren't allowed to teach the way you should have, I thought that through, I was Muslim, and I ended up leaving Or better yet, don't pay your taxes and don't be able to pay for the system. Right? Also, but there's budget cuts because we have the lowest corporate tax rate in the developed world. Right? The Brunswick is at the bottom of the OECD in terms of corporate taxation. 
How is that possible? Who can sit around in that meeting and say, all right, we're deep in debt, what are we going to do? Slash the tax rate for corporations. Don't let them pay anything. Oh, let them export all the oil in Canada out of St. John. Don't charge them a cent. Great idea. Write that down. That's policy. Okay. No taxes for corporations. Has it increased jobs? And, and what I, I had a researcher actually look at the number of handouts that were given to corporations over the last eight years. There was a promise of 11,000 jobs in exchange for the corporate communism we have. It's far beyond corporate welfare. It's really corporate communism with slightly better toilet paper than they had in the communist system. <laughs> Where are those jobs? Where have they disappeared to? And this is the staggering part. There seems to be no benefit. So we don't charge corporate taxes. We don't charge them really revenues. We don't charge them uh, royalty rates. So you don't tax what's taken out. Um, you don't really ask for anything in return. And who gets it? Well, the health system and the education system. But at the end of the day, why should corporations not? So if that theory holds, that if we don't charge corporations tax, and it will increase their ability to hire people, wouldn't the same logic be said, let's not charge the population taxes? And the money that that frees up, they'll be able to spend on things, right? So, but there's the logic. The logic is if we don't charge corporations taxes, everybody will benefit. Well, the same thing. If you don't charge the population taxes, but guess what would happen to the provincial economy? If it, people stopped paying their taxes, that would be it. The game would be up. 94% of the budget probably comes from uh, personal taxes. It's a very high percentage. So at the end of the day, there's no logic there. The jobs haven't appeared, there's no benefits to this, but this is the way that it, you control the process. You influence policy makers by constantly saying, we have to benefit or the economy tanks. And if it tanks, you're out of office. The, co the, the present government has done nothing about structural unemployment from the time they got in, and they've done nothing yet. But 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 here's the logic of it, right? So if we supply a cheap a cheap amount of wood, you'll give us jobs. Why wasn't that deal approached to Tim Hortons, right? So the new forestry deal actually employs 158 people. That's it, 158, not 500. Direct jobs, 158, right? A big stop employs about uh, 160. Average Tim Hortons, I know, what, 30, 40? So why don't we make the approach to Tim Hortons and say, if you will build 100 new Tim Hortons across New Brunswick, and God knows we need them. <laughs> we will guarantee you a free supply of coffee. In fact, we'll take a loss on it. We'll actually, you know, pay in our own pocket for the coffee and give it to you. But we will guarantee your supply of coffee, enable you to employ people. Wouldn't that make sense? Sure, but we lose money on the forest and everything. So the logic is, if I could guarantee a supply to it, I don't know, go in, we invade Guatemala or some other place and take over their coffee supply, just so we could supply, it, it, it makes no sense. If we make a loss on the forest, how does this serve anybody's interest? There aren't the jobs that are supposed to be created. And that's the myth of control, right? So the mythic control is always about scare them with the jobs. Do what we say or the jobs get it. You see the little jobs figure over in the corner with a gun put to his head, right? So if you don't do what we say, the jobs get it. And that's how you control people. People are afraid, and they're not afraid that they're gonna end up in prison. And you know, uh, in my time in, in Eastern Europe in the former Soviet Union, I've had a lot of journalist friends that were killed for writing about stories, standing up, uh, and they pay the ultimate price for that. It's not like that's gonna happen in New Brunswick. But you can lose your job, and you lose your livelihood, and, right? And everybody at the end of the day wants to live a normal life. So that's what it's all about. To so do what I say, or the jobs get it. 
but yet the jobs aren't really created. And yet we're abundant in natural resources. So why can't we benefit? And in Mongolia, for example, what they did was rip up the agreements and write new agreements, and they ended up with everyone getting about $2,000 a year out of one mine. That completely changed our economy. It doubled the salaries across the entire country because a bit was given back. Right? And that's what happens when you create a, a real resource fund where those benefits go to. There's no reason why. And everybody says here, oh, well, we just got to follow Alberta and Saskatchewan. Well, Alberta and Saskatchewan charge far higher rates on royalties than we do. Look at the pot act. How is it possible that New Brunswick charges six times less for uh, royalties on potash than Saskatchewan, the home of potash corp. <laughs> what a great deal that was. Right? Next slide. So what do we do? We fight the roots of state capture or province capture. The undue influence of corporations on public officials. That's the problem. It's the problems with shale gas. It's the problems with forests. This undue influence of corporations on the political process has to end. Break the links between corporate and provincial governance. Business does business, and the province should govern. And one of the things that Putin did when he first came into power was bring all the Russian oligarchs together and say, okay guys, here's the deal. You do business, we do governance, you stay out of ours, we'll stay out of yours. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that way. After Putin broke the back of some of the oligarchs that could genuinely offer him political opposition, the Russian government then got heavily into business themselves. So again, it's this mix of who took over who, uh, and, and at first business took over government, and then government took over business, and it's still the same problem. There is no separation between the public and private sectors. You have to, break, uh, you have to uh, increase transparency of government and access to information. If you don't do that, nothing will happen in the province because as we've seen, the only reason that we're up here uh, fighting this is because we've been able to get access to information. And the fact that the forestry agreement was published. And so this is the only way that it's going to happen. If there isn't transparency, really, and they continue to go down that road of controlling all access to information, uh, there won't be a way to fight this. But slowly there are cracks appearing in the system. And the fact is, the world has moved on. The world is moving towards greater transparency and accountability. And if New Brunswick wants to sell its products to the US, they're going to have to abide by things like the Dodd-Frank Act in the US, which is going to force all oil and gas companies to publish what they pay. So that's going to be the deal. The Europeans have already put forward on the forestry that they're going to have to abide by the extractive industry's transparency initiative. So if you want to sell wood in Europe, you're going to have to be more transparent. So the world is moving on. Uh, and in 2009, the province made a claim that if they had to publish the contracts, they would secede from confederation. <laughs> we will remain an island of opaqueness. Seriously. This is, you know, what? I don't know, is it fantasy time, or which we can say, okay, we're just simply going to opt out of NAFTA and the rest of, uh, the, rest of uh, the world's trading system so that we can just be run by one oligarch or several oligarchs? Really? That's why I uh, classified this, uh, typified this when we did the Moncton show as New Brunswickistan. It looks far more like Uzbekistan or Turkmenistan uh, without the snappy uniforms, I agree, uh, and the uh, slightly more exotic food. But we're going that way. So when you start seeing big epaulets appearing on, uh, on our public officials, you know we're in deep trouble. And uh, when we did the forest rally, people were saying, oh, it's a banana republic. I said, no, no, guys, the banana republics are actually way ahead of us. We're somewhere below that. So we're a banana republic without the bananas. A fiddlehead republic, I guess, as it were. Maybe some political scientists will coin the term at some point. Right? So what we need is political accountability and independent oversight. Are there oversight agencies in New Brunswick? Yes. Conflict of interest commissioner. On the job? 
Auditor General on the job, but nobody listens. To yes. No. Right? They do their job. Well, they do their job. job. What's that? Previous job was provincial controller. How can we keep one day and the auditor the next? Well, but still, you know, the reports are actually halfway decent, but completely ignored. At least he can count. Yeah. But uh, you actually have to be a magician with figures to make things work, right? To make all the deals work somehow and look like a, there's a good job being done, right? So where is it? Does there exist one place where people can go forward and report corruption? Not the RCMP, that's for sure. Well, it's not really the RCMP's job unless it comes to a criminal case, right? There are things out there. There's a Public Secretary Integrity Commission, but they hardly do anything. They've had eight cases in Canada uh, in the last 10 years. Probably over 800 cases they've received. So one in 100 actually they take forward. Very small number. Right, and if we look at places like Australia, each of their states has uh, an anti-corruption agency. Some work, some don't work. But at least it's one place to go. Most places in the world have some sort of anti-corruption body. That doesn't really exist. And without having somebody to be the watchdog and be taken seriously, what happens? Well, you get away with it. Well, what do you mean it's a conflict of interest to give my dad money? Oh, come on, show me that where it says that. Well, it's this part. Oh, yeah, well, no, okay, I lost the election. That's fine, I get away with it. Yeah. And I made some comments on CBC about, uh, about what happened in Cape Breton, right? So the Economic Development Agency in Cape Breton had a bunch of hacks appointed to it who didn't really know their jobs, and they still got to keep their salaries. Now, if this happened to a military family, they would have those benefits clawed back. If somebody cheated on their uh, EI, what would happen? Oh, geez, oh, the whole system would come after them. You get $200,000 a year for four years, three of which you're off on language training? You get to keep that? Oh, I don't know, half a million, a million in the bank for, uh, you know, getting a bad appointment and getting smeared a little bit in the press, that's okay. I think most of us in the room would take that deal, wouldn't you? Sure. Right? You get a bad name and what happens? Yeah. So, uh, you have to deal with the media and the situation of the concentration of ownership and you have to deconcentrate economic activity. So at the end of the day, it's really about breaking up these monopolies that exist in the media and in the economy. And then finally, you really have to reach out and have civil society come up and stand up. And we haven't been having huge numbers of people uh, standing up in the province. Right? There are a small group of dedicated ad, uh, uh, activists that are out there that are really trying, but that's it. It's a very small number. And somehow we need to reach out to the population and we have to wake people up. And as Rod says, when you explain to people, well, here's why you're getting your deer in uh, urban centers, or here's why this is happening, people are shocked. And so the word really needs to get out. So the simple version of this, stop the monopolies, increase transparency and accountability, and stand up. And we really need each of you to go out and reach out to 10 people and say, this is what's going on in the province. We live in a captured province, and now it's time to stop. Thanks. Thanks, Don. This is where we wrap it up. We've exposed a lot of things. I know it's a lot to take in, but it still comes down to one essential basis, is that we have lost legislative and economic control of our problems. That's where we're at. That's the mess we're in. And what's it going to take? Well, it's all about raising awareness. It's about building some sort of groundswell. It's about making noise. As Don said, you may be 150 here tonight, but I see it as you're all 10 more. It's more like 1,500. Because once you get it, once you understand the state that we're in, 
I assure you, you're going to talk to at least 10 people. And you're also going to convince them that this is what we need, this is the state that we're in. And somehow we have to come up with a formula that just shakes the, the government at its roots. Because that's the only way that we're going to be able to get in is we need an independent voice or we need other voices inside that's willing to stand up and deal with the truth. We're muzzled. As a whole province, we're muzzled. We do not have access. We do not have media that really covers us, reports in the right way. Three weeks ago, I got a phone call from a journalist from Radio Canada, just retired. <laughs> Mr. Terrio, Charles, he says, I'd like to uh, talk to you. I, we all see what you're doing. His name is uh, 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 Monsieur Poirier, I forget his name. Anyway, he says, uh, I'd like to talk to you. Great, so we had breakfast. He says, us at Radio Canada in Moncton, all the journalists, we watch what you're doing for the last two years. And we're just in awe. We can't believe what you're doing. And we love it. We just wish that we could do something. And I said, well, why don't you? He says, no, we've received a directive to ignore you. <laughs> and I said, why? It was CBC. I do kind of do it, but he says, you're too controversial. <laughs> and I said, what? You're too controversial. You guys are journalists. Aren't you supposed to look at controversy and report on it and analyze it? We wish we had that liberty. So, CBC at least has been interviewing all of the people that I've interviewed. They come out on my website and, oh, you know, Don McRae says this and bring them in and, you know, Jeannou Volpe and other university profs and they haven't touched Don yet. I wonder why. <laughs> but me, no, they, they don't want, they don't, can't afford to give me any credibility. Too controversial. Why? It's because they're scared. Their bosses are scared of getting legal letters. How dare you question? So we're really in a mess here, guys. How are we going to get out of it? Well, learn to stand up. Learn to be vocal. Some of you were vocal here. Take every opportunity you have when it presents itself to be vocal. Convince people. And it's interesting, the majority of the age group here are basically the retired people because they no longer fear losing their jobs. Because many of you have gained a voice you know, from the liberty of that, of taking that shackle off your shoulders. We need to encourage our youth to do the same thing. That's the state that we're in. But I encourage you, keep talking. I'm going to keep working at this, Don and Rod are going to keep working at this, and we're going to keep getting people who want to participate, and it seems to be growing. Thank God for the, the, uh, the internet, because that's the element, really, that has been building all of this. So use it. Share it. If you have the opportunity to talk to a candidate, ask him a question. Do you agree you know, that if we took business industry out of managing our crown forest, we probably should be making more money. Get them talking about it. I know that the urban areas, it's not an issue because the media has kept it quiet. They don't get it. But believe you me, in the rural areas, we get it. Kedwick is known for standing up. We burned a helicopter last year. We shot up the other one the year before. <laughs> And that's, so they're not bringing in their helicopters anymore in our area, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? The people in the rural areas get what I'm doing here and get what we're doing. And we're the ones that really are seeing this resource of ours being depleted and being given away. And to work in, with those resources, to work in that industry, you need to get that chokehold. You, you're, 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 you're choked into death. That way, okay, you can work and you'll stay quiet and, you know, don't worry. Uh, 
I won't talk up now because you know you could lose your equipment and the fact that you signed your house away to be able to buy it. And that's the fact all over New Brunswick. So I'm not sure how to close this. I could go on for an hour. But I need to close. We need to bring Rod and Don back out here. I know you've got questions and comments. We'd like to share this even more. So once again, thank you for coming, all 1,500 of you. <laughs> That's our strength here. You guys are our strength. So thanks again, and now we're going for a Q&A period. Quebec is much bigger. How they do it in Quebec compared to here? Yeah. Uh, the Forestry Act, when it, when it was created in 1982, they thought, well, prior to that, it was so political, it was a mess. We had all these little mills all over New Brunswick, had hundreds of them, but it was political in the sense that, geez, if you voted red this time around, well, maybe you got wood from the forest. And if you voted blue, you didn't, but the next election around, it got turned, you know? So, the stability within the forest industry and the mills was lacking. So they thought the best thing to do is to take the politics out of it. So we're going to split up all of the public forest into then 10 and then hand it over to the industry. Now they're going to manage it for the betterment of New Brunswickers. What they've been doing is managing it for themselves. And as the years have gone by, been managing it as set, because in their contract, they had to make sure that those little mills got their allotment. But slow but sure, they were able to manage it so that they could squeeze out that little competition. There's another one gone, there's another one gone, there's another one gone. And as, as they lost their sub-license allotment, well, then they'd be brought back into the big licensees. Now, that formula of creating licenses or licensees was touted as the best system in Canada. And every other province in Canada adopted it. Because, ooh, we're taking the politics out of it. Okay. But it didn't take very long to British Columbia to go, whoa, hold on now. Where did our revenue go? Yeah. You know? Where'd it go? And they started looking at it and they said, no, 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 no. And they took industry out of managing their public force. And they turned around and they said, I think the approach we're going to take is we're going to take those big blocks of land and instead of guaranteeing wood, we're going to put them up for auction. So the highest bidder pays for the wood. And then we're going to take forests around communities and we'll say, here, these are community-based forests. You guys figure out how to generate revenue, income, work for them. So that's the model in British Columbia. Then Ontario did the same thing. Now they, they, they took industry out of managing their forest. They're, a lot, they're focusing on community-based forestry. They're selling off their blocks. And do you know, for instance, as far as indirect jobs and jobs, and on 1,000 on cubic meters in New Brunswick creates 3.4 jobs. And that's direct and indirect. In Ontario, it's 14 jobs. Yeah. Now why? It's 14 jobs because the governance, the governments have focused and said we're going to use that forest as an economic engine to create wealth for the communities. Well, in New Brunswick, it's an economic engine to create wealth for the industry. And as they get better, they create less jobs. So that's the situation where now, Quebec last year finally changed because a filmmaker four years ago did a film and the press got behind them and then it forced the government to take the industry out of managing the ground force. Last year was, was when they signed in September. Of course, they had the press with them. I'm having, as a filmmaker, having a harder time. But we'll get there. Yeah, you know, if I could add to that, the other thing that Quebec did in 2001 is they banned the use of glyphosate 
in their forests is no longer used in Quebec. Yes. I can't believe that the forest industry is still afloat, but. <laughs> <laughs> but they're doing a good job there without it. So. Yes, absolutely. I'm just curious, uh, ask you a question. You, you insist on uh, continue to, to say public land and crown land. Uh, can you tell me how and when New Brunswick um, obtained underlying title to the Mac and Mousy territory? Yeah, they never. It's unseated. It's just, for me, for the moment, it's my reference. Okay. When I work in French, I always say les forêts publiques, public. Mm -hmm. But it's never been seated. And that's a whole other issue and battle. But it's still within the same. Thank you. Personally, as I've said in my videos, I think the forest needs to be treated as one big living entity. If we take care of it, it will take care of us. But that's always been what I've been Yes. Uh, I uh, I entered uh, St. Thomas as a mature student when I was 21, single parent, uh, went on to do the PhD, and uh, <coughs> sadly was struck with mental illness that worsened as time went on. I, I was forced to leave teaching. When I went to the Department of Social Services and found out that I was going to be expected to live on $700 a month, um, I contemplated suicide. From that day on, I have felt punished for being sick. <coughs> Do you have any suggestions as to, uh, we have the lowest rates in Canada, we're excluded so much from enjoying what the city has to offer, and I cannot lose my anger. I guess I'm, I'm asking, do you think it's possible that those of us in this position could make some kind of uh, protest to try to get someone to look at what's going on? If it's possible, yeah. well, we're trying. There's no clear answer. All I know is that we are not getting revenue from our resources. It is being given away. We could improve the lot of what's going on on every issue, on every issue if the revenues were there. Right. Now, it's all a matter of finding... I'm not saying... It's about finding a balance in all of that, in so living yeah, in all of this. That's the starting point, rather yeah. than yeah. narrowing yeah. in on yeah. social services in and of itself, I guess. Oh. Okay. Uh, I have one more question for uh, just a man okay. here. Um, about uh, six months ago or so, we got in our community, we got a letter from the um, notice from the uh, Natural Resources, and it was a notice telling us uh, not to eat deer meat because they were injecting the deer with penicillin. And um, I'm just wondering, I mean, there's been uh, an extraordinary increase in cancer in people in our communities. 
And um, do you know anything about? No, I don't know. I mean, I've been gone from DNR for two years, so there was no, there was nothing we were doing back then that would that was injecting penicillin in the deer. No. Um, no. They said Although, that they would be that they were marking the deer or something somehow, and that if we that if we shot a deer. Uh, that had a tag or had a, uh, some kind of mark on it, not to eat it. Wow, if they're starting to actually do work with deer, that'll be the first time in 20 years, it's about time. But, uh, but why I don't know, they put the, biggest thing that, the biggest thing they always were concerned about was cadmium in the liver, because it bioaccumulates in the liver and, uh, and the... Uh, Toxic? Co uh, from yeah, it's, it's heavy metals from uh, acid rain. That was the biggest thing they did work on years ago. And it was, they always said pregnant women and children. And it's also the same with fish. Um, in my slides, I'm not sure whether you noticed or not, but glyphosate is a known carcinogen now as well. But that yeah, that's what has I not get out to people. But that's why. That's why. Um, you know, I thought about that yeah. when you mentioned that that it caused uh, cancer in mice. Yeah, and productivity in deer has gone. For, used to be 95 percent of our deer were pregnant, and it's gone down to 75 percent to 80 percent. So something's going on out there, but nobody's yeah. looking at it. And mm. not to mention eventual immunity from biotic, antibiotics. That's interesting. So that came from DNR, you said? Yeah. Really? It was sent to the band offices and it was uh, sent out to the homes. Hmm. Notice. Not sure. Not to eat deer because they know we can, we want, you know, yeah, that's right. Want, but I wonder when they're going to tell me that. Yeah. <laughs> I thought that's right, they're trying to get rid of me. Uh, this question's also for Rod. Yes. Um, since Ailish Cleary seems to be brave enough to talk about the potential for health problems from shale, has your research on the glyphosate been brought to her attention and she commenting on it or reading about it? I'm not sure. Um, it's not my research actually, it's just it's stuff that's out there everywhere. It's, been, it's being published around the world. A lot of it's coming in Europe. Um, it's interesting that, that the stuff coming out of the states that's funded by Monsanto as opposed to it and says that everything's great. No surprise there, but uh, what was I going to say? The uh, oh, I wrote a letter to uh, the Department of Health in the province because actually the Department of Health, back when we were trying to get uh, deer meat uh, donated, like a hunger far farmers and hunters feeding the hungry program, and we were dealing with the Department of Health. Their their regulations are incredibly powerful. The, Department, the Minister of Health can shut down anything, anytime, any place if he has a if there's a public health concern. So I wrote to him. Uh, citing all these uh, research articles that show all the health problems that glyphosate is causing, and he sent me back a nice short letter saying he sent my letter on to the Minister of Natural Resources. So. Oh, well, maybe so the rest go. of us could give her a heads up. Well, I think, yeah, and, and again, I think there's, when you start looking at that, be prepared because it'll shock you how much information is out there and just what kind of problem we're dealing with. I couldn't believe it. Has there been any urban journalists that decided to do a story on your tour because I don't think nobody has seen a tour like this. <laughs> no. A lot of numbers, a lot of facts, and yeah. I think you should be congratulated for a job very well done. But has there been any urban media coming in? No. Is the Daily Gleaner in here? Urban, urban front of the paper? No. CBN, you get the announcement too. So. <laughs> any freaking media here from anyone? I, I see it. No, we, we haven't been able to get the announcements out on any mainstream media. That's crazy. No, they, they refuse to. I said I saw it on a poster and the guy from CBC said, really? A poster? Yeah. That's yeah. Nice. It they was know. put on Facebook yes. by a friend of mine and her post was removed. Yeah. Not by her. Yeah. Well, <laughs> happens, happens every day. We've been trying to get the word out. How many more tours? We got Mary Machine coming up again. And yeah. What else? Hillsborough and asked us to do it. And so a few Our more. Yeah. I'll invite you guys to Eastern Europe. I can fill a whole hall to hear a story like this. Yeah. In a day. Isn't that something? This place is an anesthetized from birth. My father, my late father, used to uh, used to say to Brunswickers who were born with their back in the shape of a saddle. Just wait for a rider to come by. <laughs> <laughs> It's inviting to see you settle going by, how far? <laughs> yeah, sad but true. But it's grown. It's maybe not growing as exponentially as we would want it.
But it's still... Where, where is the child of every person in here who has a child? When I go to a political meeting, I take my two sons, they're 11 and they're 13, mm -hmm. and they come to every meeting. There's no TV, there's no games, there's no play, and there's no sports. When I go to a political meeting, they're both there. They've been learning since age four. My son denounced George, my son denounced George Bush in the White House at age four from the megaphone. Where's mine, Charles? Oh, yeah. Mine's <laughs> backstage. He's been to every one of these. That's the where he should be. Yeah. And so should everybody here bring their children. You're, you're, you're hurting your own children by not forcing them to come with you. Pay them if you have to. Yes, <laughs> sir. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you guys. You guys are doing a really great job. And this is a message that a lot of us think that uh, that needs to get out there. So uh, thanks for that. Uh, I'm wondering, I uh, hear uh, mention of uh, the corruption, uh, and you're talking about how the top down, the DNR, it's the top that runs everything. Uh, you're talking about the monopoly of politics. Uh, I'm from Aurora Riding. Uh, I'm from uh, Nagwick Way. Uh, we have the AV Nagwick, of course, the sister of AV Cell. And uh, it just seems to me when they talk about the 2,000 people a year that are leaving the province, they're not leaving from Fredericton, they're not leaving from Moncton, they're not leaving from St. John, they're leaving from our rural areas. Yes. And it, it seems like uh, there's a great centralization of all the power in New Brunswick, and it, it's been brought here to Fredericton now. And I'm wondering if uh, you guys would say that that was an intentional or just a byproduct of what's going on. And it also seems uh, to remove any kind of power from, from the rural riding. It used to be the people that lived in those areas had a connection with that land and with those resources. And so they had a say into it. Yeah. But, but now it, it seems like the decisions are made from people that don't live on that land. So would you, would you guys say that, I guess, the centralization is uh, a byproduct of it, or is it an intentional uh, move? Well, the question is, who represents the voice of rural New Brunswick and politics? Uh, yeah, Chris had to go. Oh, okay. uh, he, had, he had some other things to do. But, uh, you know, I'm not up here uh, to, to promote my own campaign. Uh, well, yeah, I guess, right? But uh, the people that I talk to, everybody I talk to, they say uh, red, blue, red, blue, back and forth. Uh, we get no say, no, no matter what, either, either way. But the same people will then turn around and say, but, but what choice do you have? You know, it's, it's going to be one or the other. There, there's just, like you say, uh, we're born with a saddle on our back, I guess. Uh, we're born red or blue. And people just don't seem to understand that there's a way out. So I, I've decided to run as an independent. I was considering the NDP. But I, I, saw, I, saw <laughs> some, I saw some interference there. I really was not happy. Yeah, the $6,000 they got from the urban. Oh, other issues that I won't quite bring up. But the I've decided to, to run, now, I'm, I live in the rural riding, it's a forest riding, and the forestry workers are sort of getting behind me, because at least there's a voice there, right? And although they're not being overly vocal, I get this all from the back. <laughs> if I can get inside the ledge, then I figure the press can't ignore me as much anymore. <laughs> Right? And then if I spend four years making noise, not making promises, but getting people informed, educated, getting things done, then I suspect that four years down the road you'll see many more coming up and saying, yes, I want to be an independent. Or, you know, it, it, it's not going to be, it's not going to happen overnight. But we have to have someone inside the ledge, I hope that the Greens get in, I know the People's Alliance get in, I really do, because we need a different set of voices in there. Well, we need a voice at all. Do we need a voice? We do need a voice. We have not, right? Yes. We just need a voice. Yeah. And that, I think, is a process. I mean, we're not the guy, as Don Osman says, you know, in some of these countries, if they had what we had in New Brunswick here, they'd just 
grab a bunch of them, jump on the horses with their guns, and, and show up at the ledge. Right? right? We don't have that mentality here. What's that? They don't have a hanging tree there. They don't have a hanging <laughs> tree. <yeah. laughs> But you see, so I think the process is at least to get the voice, an independent or different voices in there, into the ledge. It's essential for us to claw our way back out of the situation. You know, right now, when you talk about that, that's the one thing. You talk about the environment, people are, but when you talk about how it's affecting their pocketbook, yeah. they'll listen. You know, this whole issue about the Irvings and selling selling power at 9, 9.6 and paying 5 for it, and it's like a subsidy of 4.6 cents, they're paying very little. Well, the guy also calculated and he said, you know what, that amount of money that we're handing over represents 500 and something to every uh, in, um, residential client in New Brunswick. That means that the elderly person uh, who has to buy its electricity extra, it's all it's like over $500. So we're paying so that this company can get that subsidy. You know, so somehow we have to get that into people's minds. We have to get them understanding how they're poisoning us because the industry says it doesn't matter. For us, at least, we can get more trees. You know, we have to get them to understand that we are really a captured province and that we have no say and we, we have a puppet governments who are not acting with it. And we have to get them to understand that the real power is the people. It really is. But we think we don't. I spoke to a liberal, my liberal opponent, and I talked to him about that. He says, well, Charles, you know, the Irvings will sort of always be there. <laughs> and I said, so what does that mean? Does that mean that we just have to take our arms down and say, okay? <laughs> and he sort of walked away. He didn't quite have an answer. Yeah, it, it seems like uh, when ever you mention anything bad about the Irvings, uh, people, oh, well, they're always going to be there. It's obviously they are. We're not. We're not talking about crushing them or bankrupting them. Or they're they're going to be there, man. But but anyway, you're not you're not talking about taking away the company and put it in public control. But the public interest can control the company. They can control the public land. They can say, this is what we will allow. You don't have to take the company away or decimate them, bankrupt them, or rush them out. You just have to control them. Or stop them from taking every last crumb in Whoville. Right. I mean, this is the aspect of it. Do they really need every single thing out there? Do they really need the forest? Do they really need it? all of this? Do they need 10 salmon camps? Or do they need 15 salmon camps? How many salmon camps do you need? There's a great question. But that's that's the nature. You can ask that. How many salmon camps? Yeah. Well, the early yeah. needed just as much as a heroin addict needs his next fix. That's that's it. That's it. Yeah. And it's as much as anybody. Corporate. Can yeah. And and this and this is what we've seen anywhere where oligarchs are allowed. It's never enough. Right. And they'll keep taking and taking and taking until the whole system crashes. When New Brunswick is bankrupt, then what? Well, the mothership will just fly off and go to Maine or no, something no, else. No, they're, they're going, listen, they're dealing with the province the same way they're dealing with their contractors. They keep a, they won't let them go bankrupt, but just about, just yeah. enough, but you keep squeezing work out of them, right? They'll do the same thing with the province. We're both bankrupt, but just, they'll keep us alive. Look how good they are. They're providing us with this and that, and that but we're just near bankruptcy. And as long as they can keep us there, they'll be able to extract. Yeah. Now we all suffer here from the from the Stockholm syndrome. We've been captured so long. You know what the Stockholm syndrome is? It's basically you really start thinking that your capture wants the best for you. It's a, it's a form of mental illness. But in New Brunswick, you hear that all the time. Thank God for the Irvings. Otherwise, yeah, Jesus they give us jobs. We'd be stuck. We'd be in a tizzy. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But, but they're they're ca it's Stockholm syndrome. They're captured. They're convinced of it, you know. And that way they can sleep at night. We're lucky that the Irvings can't buy uh, Google. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, they will. They control social media. <laughs> the, Frank, uh, I, I was uh, quite struck. First place, it's a bit 
ungenerous. I, I'm not contending what we've been, what we've heard this evening. It's a bit ungenerous to use the term corruption because uh, about eight years ago I, I was given very, very generous hour where a member of the Department of the Environment explained to me that I was under the false impression that they were there to protect the environment. You know, and he was quite serious. You know, he explained that that's not the purpose of the organization. You know, and, and he's not corrupt, he's intelligent, he's a lawyer, uh, and uh, it's just not their mission. Uh, so corruption, you know, he, there's a, there's a, in that space, perhaps, but it's it's not personal, and and I and I find it uh, difficult to accuse many people in the province of, of being corrupt at any personal level, and you point that out. But uh, I I had this incredible sense of déjà vu when you said, "What are we supposed to do?" You know, the outlines of responsible government, and well, we've had in this province responsible governments in 1858. Uh, you know, in the previous decade, in the Liverpool government, and under the new queen, the, uh, the uh, larger white colonies uh, were pretty much instructed that uh, government was not to be in the pocket of limited interests and coincident with them, that they had to be separate. And uh, I've, used, I've often thought, you know, that the packet ship that brought that to Canada uh, didn't stop in St. John. But uh, in 1858, uh, uh, an act of the legislature established responsible government. So uh, we just have to go back uh, to ask our uh, elected officials to read it. Uh, sure, or, or if they would enforce the 1913 anti-corruption law, which has been on the books forever. Yeah. I mean, we don't. We have the lowest rate of prosecution of corrupt officials in the developed world. But uh, th this is not fun. None of us, it's not funny to degree to the, the government has ceased to understand that it acts in the public interest. David, you better be in there. <laughs> Thank you. Well, Thank you, Frank. Well, this is more of a testimonial. In what you're saying about control on how well it's done, anyone that tries to act against what I call the ruling class, uh, there's repercussions. Uh, they're punitive. Uh, you had mentioned that, that, well, one of the things that I learned with Occupy was uh, two things that were told to me with people not speaking out is I am going to lose my job or I am applying for work and I will not get work. And when you stand against the forces, they demonize you. Uh, they turn you into a madman or madwoman uh, that you're not playing with your faculties. I'll give a little yarn, and this is like on how the roles remain the same, but the faces change. My colleague, John Bosnich, and I were very uh, active at UNB. He was the uh, president of the student union. And uh, our, our belief was was a, uh, a, a student union for the students. Uh, well, the end results was of uh, the things that we were trying to do is uh, John got he got kicked out from UND for 20, 30 years. He was just recently admitted. 28 years. 28 years. I was a uh, station director at CHSR. I was uh, approached uh, by uh, Susan Montague at the time, who was uh, the uh, public relations officer under uh, President Downey, to uh, tell my news people how to tell the news. I said, no way. There was myself, the, uh, the uh, yearbook and the uh, Brunswick and we were all called to, together to manipulate the news to only to basically it was to make John look bad, make Downey look good. Talk little about Bosnich's success, talk a lot about his failures. The inverse with President Baum. Uh, downplay his failures, upplay his success. I said no way. Uh, I go to the radio station and uh, I have an escort. So this is living out in the field. What happens when you try to make changes? The opposition, how much control, you know, you know, the Irvings has, and you know, it's been said here tonight on controlling the paper. Uh, you know, social media is still great, and you know, to talk to 
It, it, it is a, di a different world because if I try to talk to my neighbors about the issues, they're almost like, well, oh, you're talking religion to me. Like It's like they plug their ears and they don't want to listen to what you have to say because you're not you know, part of the day, you're not part of the Irving thing, so therefore you're not credibility. So that's the other hurdle that we have to try to get through is this credibility point is that, you know, like I said earlier, uh, you know, we're demonized. Uh, just one, one last uh, example, a couple of years ago, uh, Leo Hayes, some of the students protested uh, for uh, anti-bullying because the school was not dealing with bullying quite properly. Uh, Kevin Potter, who was the uh, principal at that time, he, uh, one of the two of the uh, leaders, they were graduating that year. Because of that, he prevented them from walking across the graduation stage. And, and that's, what message does that tell, you know, people, I have my daughter here tonight. Uh, and what message, she's Leo Hayes, uh, what message does that tell her about speaking up? If you speak up, there's going to be consequences, bad consequences. So, you know, we, you know, we think you're working on the right strategy, but there's still other angles that has to, you know, come out to get this across to the, you know, the, to the Brunswickers, because the Brunswickers don't know, you know, what is going on. They believe that SWN is correct. They believe that Irving is uh, can only speak truth. Everyone else speaks with four tongue. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Um, Don't wrap it up when people are ready to talk. It's so rare. I know, I know, but we've only rented this place for so long. When, when's that till? Let's pay we're, the we're already past. Well, are they coming in um, with the guns oh, and, and did I mention that Council of Canadians does not accept donations from corporations or government, and we have silver buckets out there to help pay for the costs of the venue and the overages for the venue. We're hoping everybody feels really generous tonight because, you know, uh, we are a registered nonprofit corporation, and... Um, uh, we really have to um, wrap things up. Um, how much do you owe for the overage? Well, Is there somebody from Playhouse here? How much do you owe? I, I can't get into that right well, now. But just tell us we'll pay I, I appreciate all the questions and stuff, and but we really do need to wrap it up. Well, hopefully a few of us are waiting to talk. Can talk three or four of us. Or we'll, we're, we'll be out there. Yeah, we'll, we'll be available. Be available. And we can come back. Yeah. We'll, we'll come back. We'll yeah, come back any time, but, you know, please. Thank you. A man suggests that this is such a beautiful city that you should hold your meetings outdoors and get a good PA system that a few people walking by might join you rather than hiding in here and paying the playhouse to have freedom of speech. Not a good way. Use the outdoors. It belongs to you. Breaking outdoors. Thank you all for coming. Thank you all for coming. Uh, one last little thing, it's a pitch, one last little thing, uh, that it's not very, to be a revolutionary it's not, doesn't pay well. Uh, Actually it does, not does, here. Not here. It pays well. I have, I have these bumper stickers uh, that is uh, a giveaway for a donation of $10, that helps to pay the gas for me to come back here, back home. So thank you. But thank you all for coming thank tonight. You. Much appreciated. <laughs> Tell your friends. Tell your family. Tell your kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Char. Oh, we'll go shake some.
Legislature. In the center of your screen, the most corrupt government on the planet. Folks, oh, right there. Trying to prove yeah. it's waterproof? <laughs> <laughs> I know it is. You are. Fredericton Playhouse. There we go. Oh, smoke. Okay, folks, so we'll be back with more interviews shortly, but right now I need to smoke and keep this warm. Ciao, folks. <laughs>